first I want to say thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, I already knew, like we were kind of like talking about before we uh, hit record, we never really crossed paths, but I always knew of you. I knew a lot of guys that served with you. I, you know, I knew your kind of your history and knew what the things that you've done. But then I was reading through your bio, and uh, you have really accomplished a heck of a lot after you got out. That um, it's just it's it's fascinating. I mean that, and it, education is one of kind of one of my passions. So when oh, I started reading through your bio, I was like, wow, this yeah. you have really you've really done a lot to kind of move that forward. So yeah, this is it's amazing. It really is cool. Yeah. Well, that's kind of where I want to start. Okay. Um, you know, when I I left the Air Force, I had two master's degrees a bachelor's degrees and three associates. Yeah. And then I use my GI bill to get my doctorate in education. Nice. And that passion for education came when I, when I was getting recruited to go to the schoolhouse. Okay. So I, I mentioned to you, I, I, I arrived at, at Herbert September of, of 92. Um, but in uh, leading up to that, uh, I had um, been down there a few times because I was at Benning and uh, I ran into Boot Morrison and he's like, you should come down. And, and there was other, Bummy was there and a few others and Ray Carver, you know, so people I knew. And I was like, really, do I want to go to the schoolhouse? Um, and then at that time I was seven years in the Rangers, but long story short, um, Boot said to me, Bruce Morrison said, listen, what are you going to do when you get out, man? You know, right. you, you know, you're going to be 40 because I was on the path to being a, a 20 guy. You know, and he's like, man, you come down here, you get licensed, you get certified and you teach. And that that's where my passion came. And then, of course, boom, as soon as I got out, I joined. Well, I joined the Troops to Teachers program. OK. And the Troops to Teachers program was taking military guys and putting them in inner city schools. Nice. And for me, I grew up in an inner city school in St. Louis. Oh, OK. And so when I heard about that, boom, the next thing I did was I went back to the University of Oklahoma and got my teacher's education master's degree. And then I was hired. I, I got I got out May 1st. I took six months to hang out in Europe. I got back uh, the end of August. And by October 15th, I had a job. Wow. And I spent the last 17 years as a principal. Nice. In, in, in inner city schools in mass in Boston. Right. You're, and that's I, I read that and I was like, he, you are the perfect guy to fill that role because we, as we know, I mean, it's no hit on them. It's not their fault, but they just happen to come from not so privileged backgrounds. They need that structure in the school setting and you're the perfect guy to give it to them. I'm sure. I'm, you know. Oh, yeah. And I went in, I, you know, one of my schools had gang members in it. Yeah. There, were, there were wannabe. They were middle school. I, uh -huh. I did middle school. Um, four, I had four middle schools during that 17 years. Oh, okay. They, they were wannabes being recruited. But to to the point, nothing ever scared me. You know, people were like, oh, aren't you scared? I'm like, come on. I've been shot at. I have jumped into combat. I mean, no, I said, but more importantly, I made a connection to him because I I'd said, dudes, I grew up just like you. OK, I, yeah. we were in St. Louis. We were a bunch of poor black and white kids. Right. You know, and nobody cared about us. So, you know, I went in and I brought that military structure, having been at the schoolhouse for four years. I knew what education was about. And how to set up the structure and and working with the diverse population that came through the schoolhouse. Oh, for sure, yeah. Uh, you know, I had belief in everybody, and we made great schools. Actually, five times uh, the Department of Education has recognized my schools for excellence. That's awesome. That's and, really cool. Um, so I wanted to start with that because uh, you know, for the guys out there, anybody, uh, the path you move forward starts through the military and the skills you develop and, and, and the, and the path you choose. And like I said, when I went to the schoolhouse, you know, Bruce Morrison was like, Dan, you're going to be able to go and be an educator if that's what you wanted to do. And because I had been a training manager and I had done, um, I was the parachute guy right. and done a lot to help others train. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. I was like, yeah, I think that's what I wanted to do. And then long story short in that, when I was at Lake and Heath, at, at Mildenhall, my last assignment, there was a sign that said, come support kids whose parents are deployed and come mentor them at lunch. So it was a 30 minute long story short, 30 minutes turned into three hours. 
<laughs> because I really enjoyed hanging out with the kids and helping them right. and, and everything. And then, um, you know, one day the principal came up and said, boy, you should be a teacher. And I was like, you know, I've been kind of thinking about that. <laughs> and so here I am, you know, 20 something years later, 17 years as a principal. That's uh, awesome. I tutor, I tutor kids, a bunch of kids um, getting ready in Massachusetts. They have the, the Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment, the MCAS, okay. like every state does. So I just work with a bunch of kids after school and stuff as an extra, as an extra piece. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's almost been, like a natural path for you to pursue, you know, as, as you went along, you know, like it just, you're, it yeah. was a passion of yours and man, it just worked out. Well, it, and it manifested through the things I did in the military. Sure. And one of them was being at the schoolhouse. And so, um, you know, you, you just got to follow that path, right? You know, wherever God leads you, 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 <laughs> the door is open. You gotta, you gotta see it. And when you see it, take it. And, That's right. Uh, so here I am and, um, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm, I got a, my son's in seventh grade, my youngest, Okay. he's a seventh grader. So I actually just had an interview to go work at a community college. So oh, all right. Nice. Uh, you're in Massachusetts. If you work in the state system, your kids get free education. So. Oh, nice. So, right on. After, yeah. I've had six. He's the sixth, but actually it's pretty good. It's, um, it's a, actually being a military veteran rep at a community college. So. Oh, nice. Perfect. And, and then they, they teach, they have education classes. So because I have a doctorate, I'll, um, I'm going to up my salary by teaching one or two classes there. Excellent. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to the next phase. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. So, I that, mean, did you want to yeah, go back and, uh, yeah, yeah, well, talk about yeah, the beginning yeah, yeah. and, Talk about the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I heard uh, V-Man talking about um, when he went to Lackland. And I, 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 it brought back some memories. I I went into the Air Force. You know, they had back then, and they still do, they had this big recruiter center. And I walked in. My grandfather was uh, was airborne in World War II. And and so I, I, um, uh, I graduated high school by the grace of God. And I. Uh, um, the economy fell apart and I was like, what the hell am I going to do? I just pulled my ass out of, out of the streets of St. Louis and put it back on track and graduated. And I walked by the sign and it said, join the military. So I walked in and I, I went into the army and, and I said, I want to jump out of airplanes like my grandpa and, and, and everything. But then I saw the sign air force and I went down there and the guy said, Oh, I got a job for you. <laughs> and, he, and, and it was, it was whatever he called it. I, I don't know if he said it was a 275 or a TAC RP or whatever. Right, right. But I went in guaranteed nice. to be to be a guy. And then what was really weird, when we were at Lackland, when they called everybody out to go to Lowry and Keesler and everything, I'd be standing there all by myself. And the TIs would come up and, hey, dip it. Don't you know where you're going? And I'm like, <laughs> dude, I... I I'm going to a place called Herbert Field. You didn't call that, you know? And so, <laughs> so you know, they have a bad cop and a good cop for your TA, right? right, right. So the bad cops, you know, call me idiot and stupid, and I don't know what I'm doing. And the good cop's like, wait a second. I think he might have heard somebody, because I was an Eagle 3 kid. Okay. So there had to be some others come before me. So long story short, he finds out that I'm really going to Herbert Field. OK, and then there's nobody to take me. So when all the people go off to do their thing, I'm just standing there. So he lets me have free time. And he's oh, nice. like, you must be somebody special because Herbert feels like special operations. And then, you know, I, I, I told him what I was going to do. And he's like, oh, yeah. Huh. And so, you know, I went down to Herbert. I was an Eagle three guy. Um, and, and here's the other thing about going to Herbert. I actually had an assignment follow on from Herbert to be an instructor. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there was a, a Jake. I can't remember Jake's last name. Dan Gilliam. They had preceded me in Eagle One and Eagle Two, and I guess they were taking one student from every class. Oh, okay. To be an instructor, um, but I wanted to go airborne, yeah. and so they couldn't guarantee that I would jump because they only had so many slots, right. and the older guys had the, the the positions, and so I was like, no, I'm I I want to go airborne, so. Um, from there, I went to Bragg. Nice. And, um, you know, when, when we went to airborne school, it was nothing. I was the only Air Force guy. That I hung out with the Marines, but the PT at, at, at Herbert, you know, the guys that ran it, you know, we were in so, you know, we could 
do a hundred thousand pushups and right. run all day. And it, it was fun and it was great. And uh, ended up at Debt One Fort Bragg. And um, it was awesome. Um, first day I showed up, they took me on a ride to go out to the drop zone. The whole unit was jumping. And so I got to see him come out and I was like, okay, that's me <laughs> next. Right. So um, uh, Fort Bragg was awesome. Um, you know, we had Joe Walks, who recently passed. We called mm -hmm. him Daddy Walks. And uh, yeah. Jack Hogan was there and um, just so many other guys. Um, that's where I, I met um, all the guys. And then one day um, they came down and said, we got some Ranger School slots. And I, I was like, I'm going, you know. And right. what I had done prior to that, um, I went to Ricondo School at Fort Bragg. Yeah. And so it was a it was a mini ranger school, but it was called Ricondo School. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Chris Osak and myself got to go there. He was he was ruck, rucksack, and I was tent peg was our call sign. <laughs> and uh, we we went through Ricondo School, and then after that, I went to Water Survival. And then the next thing, um, they came down with Siri um, Survival, Escape, Resistance, and Evasion. Mm -hmm. That uh, Colonel um, Jack Ro um, Colonel Rowe. Yep. I don't know if any, you, he was assassinated in the Philippines, but Colonel Rowe was a POW right. and he actually at Camp McCall, he ran a, a survival course and an instructor course. And so uh, Toby Southern had gone before. And so he got, I got a slot and I went and I became a SEER uh, graduate and then a SEER instructor. Nice. And, um, and I came out of SEER and, and SEER school, um, you know, you spent the last 10 days kind of um living off the land so i get out of seer school and then before you know it a month later we're going to grenada it was quite the one after the other and of course i was one of the first guys at fort bragg um to get assigned to go to to get on an airplane to go to grenada and um two things about it mark mentioned it you know whenever i was like we're going to grenada i was like where the hell's grenada you know? right. <laughs> So, and I'll tell you a little story about what I know and why we, we did that in a minute, but I want to tell the, the story. So we, you know, we get called in, we're all like running around. Everybody's like, yeah, this is a bunch of BS, you know, and you know, it's typical, you know, I, whatever they called it tier, it wasn't tier one or RRF one, right, right. Right. you know, that thing. Yeah. So, you know, we were like, well, we're not RRF one. Cause I was in first brigade. And they're like, no. And then, you know, Joe and, and the Colonel and everybody went, Dan, we want you to go. Charlie Daniels, Jimmy Felton, you know, just guys who had been around a little bit. And, you know, I just come off of a lot of training. And, and so, boom, we were going. And I remember going down to the staging area. And this is, I'll never forget it. We go through, man, they're handing us grenades and, and weapons and, and we're getting all the bullets we want. And we're, we get through the line and we're all like, we don't have any smoke, you know, yeah. and, you know, that's number one tool for a uh, forward air controller. Sure. So we go to the guy and said, Hey, can we get smoke? Oh no, no, no. You can't have smoke. You got to have waivers and we can't, you can't have <laughs> smoke on the, on the airplane. And we're like, wait a second. You just give Joe Snuffy private a grenade. Right. Okay. Yeah. Blow, it'll blow a freaking hole in the side of the airplane. And you're worried about, but, but the, in the, in the air forces day, you know, if you had smoke, you had to register because of white phosphorus and the, oh, yeah. and, the, and and so forth. But we were saying, dude, that's that's for peacetime. This is wartime. Right. You just gave everybody. I got ten grenades in my pocket, <laughs> right. okay? And you're worried about giving me smoke? And then we, you know, we're all like, we're Air Force guys. Our job is to mark targets. But we, you know, we, we'll throw a grenade, but we'd rather have a white phosphorus or a red grenade, you know, smoke sure. grenade, and so forth. It took them like almost an hour to get approval to give us. Uh, smoke grenades. <laughs> I just laughed my head off. They yeah. were handing out everything. It was a candy store, you know. All Anything. Right. Oh, you wanted, you wanted a, a, a well, you couldn't get a bazooka, but you know, you wanted a handheld this or this, that, and the other. You got it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you couldn't get smoke. So, and then uh, we went to the to Grenada. Um, but we had parachutes on, but we didn't jump. Yeah. Um, by that time, they had secured the airfield. Um, and then Mark talked about how, you know, so many questions came out of the fact you had all these airborne people, they never jumped. And then, you know, he talked about Panama. I'll talk about that when we get to Panama. But, uh, you know, we went into Grenada. We did some missions. Um, wasn't really much to do. There was a little bit of resistance. 
But one of the things that was very interesting about Grenada was they had a Navy aircraft carrier there and we couldn't talk to it. And it, it had a bunch of A7s on it. Oh. So so um, we had Major Nelson, I think it was his name. Uh, he, he'll be on that sheet, but he was an ex-Navy guy. So was Terry Bittner. But um, they flew out on a helicopter to the carrier to get in contact so that we could start talking to each other. Okay. Okay. And so cool. we, we got in hold of the, the A7s and we started using them for, we had like four or five missions with them. Nice. Um, and so we had taken over uh, one end of the airfield in Grenada where they were building the um, terminal and it was empty. So Air Force all took it over. You might there, There's some pictures of us all hanging out there. And then the, when the tailors came down, it all, it became the, uh, the, the staging center for maps and all that. Oh, okay. So they set up there, you know, where, when the airplanes came in the manifest for everything. So what was really cool about that was every time there was a pallet came in, we knew exactly what was on it. So we had, uh, I turned, uh, I turned 21 in Grenada. No, I turned 23. Um, and um, we, we found the, the, the palace with Heineken in it. And, uh, <laughs> And we had, and then we had the, 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 back then, you know, they had MREs, but they were still in the test phase. Yeah. And we found the pallets with all the MREs. So, you know, we had pound cake and Heineken for my birthday. <laughs> right uh, on. And, yeah, it was right. <laughs> so the, the tailors. And then the other thing they, when the, when they brought all the students down that were there on the, on the Island, mm-hmm. there, there was a bunch of medical students. They brought them down and staged them where we were. Oh, okay. So they all came down and, you know, they were, they had MPs watching them, but they were just hanging out and we were, they were walking over to us and we were walking over to them and we were like, Hey, were you really hostages and everything? And they were like, no, not really. We were kind of, you know, told to stay in place. There were some people around, but you know, it was scary. We didn't know what was going on. And then of course they're like, we got all kinds of things back in our, in our barracks, in our, in our, the places we were stayed. So we took them down a bunch of names and a bunch of addresses and, and they told us where their stuff was. Some people didn't even have a chance to get their passports. And stuff. So we went back to their rooms and gathered up as much as we could based on what they said. We were worried about getting charged for looting. So <laughs> right. we, we had them write down that we give permission to, for, you know, I think I wasn't a sergeant. No, I was a sergeant. Maybe not. But whatever. Senior Mahanikin, you know, he, he can go. He's getting some important papers, you know. And, and then, of course, we went up to the guys and said, why don't we just take a truck and take all these people back and let them gather. Pers- just tell them you get one bag. You're they right. said, no, absolutely not. And then what was, we didn't know what was happening. The reason why they didn't want them to leave is because the next thing, an airplane showed up with the press. Oh. Uh, because they banned the press from Grenada. Yeah. Yeah. So they, there was no press. And that was, they were, they brought the students to that end of the airfield so that they would be isolated. And then the press could come and talk to them. Oh, okay. And so that's how they hooked them all up. And then we said, okay, when they're done, just let us know. You know, we'll, we'll get, you know, we had Jeeps. We said, we'll, we'll throw whatever, but they, they wouldn't let us go get it. So we went and grabbed as much as we could. And they said, take whatever you want. And we were like, well, I don't really, you know, want to take <laughs> your stuff. Right, um, right. But, you know, we did grab a few things that people really want. You know, somebody said, you know, I got my wedding ring there or whatever. You know, I can't remember the items we did. And then we, we came back uh, in the middle of the night. We couldn't come back. You know, nobody wanted to come back. Uh, they didn't know how people were going to take it. Sure. You know, so coming back from Vietnam. So we all came back on late flights and just went back into debt one, into the, into the squadron, into the, into the place. And just, we were there. <laughs> and uh, so then we came, when after that, they came out with the uh, ranger school. I sent you a list of the ranger school grads mm-hmm. yep. that I received. So we were, I don't. There, I, I think most of the ones that, that were, were before us were SPs. I guess I don't know who some of those people were, but I do know that um, you know Vallega was the first, um, and then there was um, um, uh, Greg. Greg Mosley went, mm. and, and I got to go. And in for Ranger School, you know, Mark talked about did we do pre pre Ranger? I I knew a guy 
that I met at Camp McCall that was part of Recondo. He was a special forces guy and I was working out. Um, I did every morning. I, I ran about five, six miles at lunch. I swam. And then at night I rucked. Mm-hmm. And in between I do push-ups and, and so forth. Anyway, I was at the, at the, at the gym, um, after my swim and I ran into the guy and he's like, Hey, and I was like, I know you. He's like, yeah, tent peg. He, I was like, Oh, okay. No. <laughs> and, uh, he was an old B 52 tail gunner. And, uh, then he got out and became special forces and he worked at camp McCall and, uh, he, so we're, we're talking and he's, and he's like, what are you going to do? And, you know, and I said, I'm getting ready to go to ranger school. And he's like, oh, you'll do really well. I said, and then we got talking, should I do pre-ranger? Cause they, they offered us pre-ranger slots. Mm-hmm. And I guess it was through Scotty and those guys down at, 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 um, Savannah at, at oh, okay. first. Bank. Um, and he said, don't do rangers. Don't do pre-ranger because, um, they kind of beat you up a little bit and you don't need to be beat up because you're going to get beat up enough in ranger school. <laughs> so because I had done ranger school, I mean, Recondo school and I'd done Siri, um, you know, he's like, nah, just get in shape. Just you'll, you'll have the skills. We taught you all that stuff in Recondo. You're an operator, you know, radio guy. You're not going to, you can navigate. You're not going to have any problem. Yeah. And, and then for ranger school, you know, the two things that, that we're all about. It was sleep deprivation and one meal a day. I was a winter ranger. And, <sighs> and so, um, I was six dash 84 fortune favors the bold. <laughs> and there were 200 and I think I was like 215 was my roster number. We graduated 89. Wow. So, um, but you know, he, he helped me a lot. I would meet up with him for training. And one of the things he told me about ranger school, he said, listen, every morning they're going to get you up at four, four thirty to go run. He said, don't be either be in the front or in the back. He said, don't be in the middle. And I was like, well, what? And he said, oh, the accordion effect, oh, you yeah. know, they take off like a bat out of hell. He said, but you're going to get hurt because you're either going to fall over somebody or somebody's going to push you down because it's four 30 in the morning, it's pitch dark. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're running like, a, cause they got people yelling at you. And if you fall out, they got a truck to throw you in, you know, uh-huh. and you, you'll be able to run. And he knew I was running six miles, a, you know, every morning doing, you know, I was doing five minute, six minute miles. And he's like, you're not going to have any problem. Injury is the issue you got to worry about. Right. So, Sure enough, I had a, there was a, there was a guy who was, um, I, I think he was a Marine. He was a foreign servant, whatever. He was a really cool guy and he was in the 200. So we always hung out together. And one morning I, I didn't see him after PT. Cause after, after PT, they run you to the chow hall and they give you a spoon and you got like 30 seconds to eat, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then you're back and I'm looking around. I'm like, where's the dude? Long story short, he, he, he was running. They took off like a bat out of hell. Next thing you know, there was three guys laying on the ground and he fell over it and blew out his knee. Oh man. And so, yeah. So I'd hang out in the back and those guys would come up. The instructors, they'd get in my ear and they'd be yelling, you, you're going to, you know, you slug, you're going to throw out. And I'm like, dude, no, no worries. I'm not worried. And they'd <laughs> right. say, you better get running, man. I just take off like a bat out of hell. And they go, okay, what's this guy doing? Right. So, Soon it didn't take them long to figure out I was an Air Force guy. So now they're like, "What the hell's your problem?" So this one, this one Ranger instructor came up to me one one day, a couple days into the runs, and it was after breakfast and everything. He's like, "Are you a slug? What are you doing hanging out? You you can run. I know you can. I saw your PT scores because you know you have to do the pull ups, the push ups, and the run. You know, and I I did excellent on all of that and." um, He's like, what are you doing? And I told him the story. I said, I'm not going to get hurt, man. I'm not going to get hurt because you guys, you start out, they, you know, they would run, you'd sing your little airborne ranger song. And then next thing you know, the the guys would take off like a bat out of hell and you, and then they'd be yelling at you. You better get one arm's length from the guy in front of you. And then everybody's running, trying to find everybody and it's pitch dark and everything. I'm like, and I told him, I said, I'm not getting hurt. And, and then, of course, I started helping guys when guys would fall out and they'd fall back. And I said, come on, dude, you can make it. You can do it. It's just psychological. Yeah. Um, but then, of course, they kept us up all night. Um, you know, the big thing for us, you know, Mark was talking about for him, they were worried about ransacking their barracks. For us, they made us stay up every night and redo our ranger eyes at the back of our PCs, you know. Yeah, oh, man. I mean, it, because they they tear them off 
you know, we had to do stupid shit. We never had to really get harassed. It was just, we had all these tasks to do. Mm. And so, you know, you, you stay up till midnight or whatever, but I never sleep, never bothered me. Yeah. Uh, what bothered me was a lack of food okay. that got me so bad. Um, and, and one of the stories I'll, well, I, I want to talk about blueberry pancakes cause Mark talked about it. <laughs> um, I never got the chance to go back to D- Dahlonega, but, um, I make blueberry pancakes for my family and I make them just like Delonica does. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, well, they, what they do is they pure puree the the blueberries. Oh okay. So in the pancake mix is the puree blueberry, and so they're blueberried, okay. And then my kids love them, and and that's what we eat in Ranger School. It wasn't really the the blueberry pun were pretty good. It was the fact that you put three scoops of sugar on top and five things of of um, peanut butter, you know, and, right. and two syrup packs. It was all the sugar and stuff on it, but they were, yeah. they were, they were good. And uh, when I went through Dahlonega, we stayed in the old huts and, um, and that was fun. But the blueberry pancakes were nice hmm. because um, you had a hot breakfast. You sure. didn't really, you know, at Benning, you kind of did um, when you went to the Darby queen and that, that part, um, you know, it, it was, you got one MRE, so you didn't really have a lot of hot food, but you got a hot food every, every morning and blueberry pancakes were the thing. Um, and to this day, I still make blueberry pancakes for my kids and I tell them the story, uh, but, the one, but, but about food. So we went to, to the desert and we were at, uh, Fort bliss and, um, you could hear this whenever, whenever somebody says, well, when you were at Fort Bliss, how did you find food? Well, you know how it's typical of, of people when they go, they eat half the MRE box and throw the rest away. Mm. Well, at that time, they still had sea rats. You could, you would, we'd be walking along the desert floor and you'd run into a place where they had the tank traps and the tank set up and you could see where they were, had an operating base or some type of, of, of system there. And for next thing you know, you hear everybody kicking cans. <laughs> okay. And when you hear it thump, you knew you had a can of food. Nice. Okay. Because the tin can, just tin can. But when you kick in, it was a thump. Uh, you, you, you know, and so we would, I don't know how it was, but we'd always find our way into these areas where there was all these cans of food. I don't know if the RIs led us there thinking that we could s- snatch up some food. And then what you would do when you did went to your hide site during the day, you know, you, you were allowed to go to the bathroom. Well, we'd sit down and say, okay, I want you to go east. You're going to go west and go out, find us MRE, you know, find us food. Yeah. Because all across Fort Bliss, the desert, there was one encampment after another. There sure. was stashes of food everywhere. And you'd come back and you'd and then go down the line. Go out 230 degrees for, you know, 600 meters and you'll <laughs> find food. And so you'd go out and you'd fill up your cargo pockets with, with, MR, with uh, sea rats and then you'd come back. <laughs> So that's awesome. It, yeah, it, it was the trick. And then in Florida, again, food was the issue. Um, I didn't know this until one day I, I was coming back from the clinic and, and the clinic was run by the air force people. So when uh-huh. I went to the clinic and I, 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 I don't know, I, I, I get in a little jungle rod or they wanted, you know, every day they checked your feet. So I had to go down there to get some cream or something. Uh, it might have been for my hands too, and um, and then the girls like, and they had my medical, and she's like, "You're Air Force," and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm Air Force," and she's like, "You're going through Ranger School, you know," and obviously she knew what it was, and she said, "You stay here." Next thing I know, she brings me back this pork chop dinner, you know, and she says, "You get this, you stay, you stay here, you stay here and eat," and so it, it did, it, and then there was like three of them. And they were all sitting there talking to me, asking me how I, you know, and I told them who I was and what I did and everything. And they're like, really? we never seen any Air Force guys. I said, well, I'm one of them. Yeah. And so they said, you should come back every day. And and so you come back every day and we'll bring you food. And I said, okay, but don't, I, if I get caught, I'm going to get in trouble. Well, one day I was walking back and I had to leave because some people showed up. And so I, I'm stuffing the food and then I go out behind the barracks and I'm sitting there munching it down because you can't go back in because people can smell pork chops from a mile away. You know? right, right. They haven't eaten in, in weeks, you know? And so all of a sudden I see these two Ranger guys 
And I knew they were from the battalion uh, because eventually I graduate, grad, you know, found my way over to them uh, just in hanging out as Ranger buddies. And they, the Rangers, every battalion, every whatever they had set up, whether it was their squad or whatever, they had a place hidden in, in at the Ranger camp out there at Ox 9, I think it was for for the ranger school anyway wherever they had a, a coordinates and they had buried food oh and they and they and when they got there they knew where it was and then what happened is at the end of of that phase which is pretty much you graduated yeah you had one or two days where we could go to the bx all we wanted and everything well you know they're out there buying jars of peanut butter and all this non-perishable stuff um so they could go back and bury it nice yeah so they would <laughs> So, so, so that's how they got food. I got food because some Air Force guys felt sorry for some medics that felt sorry for me and started. Oh eating. man, I've never heard those stories before. That's like, that's yeah. awesome. I wonder if that yeah. still goes on today. I wonder if they still I, do that. I, it it seemed to be like that was the tradition. Yeah. For, you know, at that time it was only first and second bat. Sure. You know, so and I'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, no, that no, that was a comment because I'd say, how do you know? Where, oh no, at my. That's that's my job. When I leave, you know, they, they were like, "Oh, I'm getting big trouble if that if there's not if I don't replenish that food for the next group, I'm 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 going to get dogged to death." So that's awesome. they're out there buying because I'm you know I'm I'm watching them because I now I know they got food stash and I'm watching them buy all this food. I'm like, "There's no way you could eat it." Right. I mean, right. And, and then because you hadn't eaten so much, you know, as soon as you ate a candy bar, it went right out the other end. You know, I mean, <laughs> you could, you just your your body was just couldn't hold him and it would just go through and i'm like you can't eat all that food and they're like no we got to replenish man we got to go back out and what they 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 had they had um like the old you used to get milk you know back in the day they delivered milk to your front porch oh you know, yeah, one yeah. Of those containers. apparently they had these little airtight containers where no bugs or animals could get in it and they could bury it and they had a quarter and they had a had a place to bury it and everybody knew where it was how about that how and it about had been that? going on as for as long as I know. Oh man. So, but uh, I wonder if that's yeah. I'm, I'm curious to know if that's going on today. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I went out when I was at Herbert. I went over there one time to bring in some AC, AC 130s for one of the. And I meant, but I was like, how do I find out? Because these these students are still students. Sure. So I didn't want to get them busted. Right. Like, hey, where's your stash? You guys still yeah. stash? <laughs> so I was just like, hey, I would think it kept go- because it was a common thing. I mean, yeah. everybody from. The, from the first and second battalion, you know, the Rangers that were there, they, they were feeding like pigs and hogs at the end of the course. Cause they had buried food there. That's awesome. Um, yeah. It was pretty funny. So anyway, uh, got back from Ranger school. One of the things that, that I wanted to talk about um, that led me to think I put together three courses called press. It was P R E S S and I called it pre service schools. Okay. Right. And one of the things that I wanted to do, and I, I ran two, we scheduled a third and then I got assigned. I, I was, I left to go to Benning, but um, having graduated Recondo, you know, water survival, Siri, Siri instructor, Ranger school. Now um, I, I just knew a lot of guys were failing and not because we had guys go, right. they took a slot. They didn't make it for whatever reason. And I, I, I ran press, and I, I think Mark was part of it, but a bunch of the guys from Bragg, uh, Hosey was, and w- what we did is we set up a mini two week course. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing was to tell these stories and to talk about what, you know, what you had to do to prepare. Um, you know, what, what, what did Ranger school look like? What, what did Recondo, what was scuba like? What was, you know, all these things t- and gave them insight into the preparation. And we kind of set up our own pre Ranger. Oh, that's awesome. Type of thing. And so we had lots of guys. And I, I ran into guys throughout my time that said, I went through press one. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, there was 15 of you. I, I don't remember everybody. Okay. But, you know, I ran into a bunch of guys that said that they did press. And the idea was to share the stories of how you dealt with, you know, sleep deprivation, food, you know, what was, you know, Benning like, what was the Darby Queen like and that city phase. And then, you know, what was the mountains, the desert and the Florida phase. And so, you know, just all those do's and don'ts. And we didn't dog them, uh, but we did put them on land nav courses. We did night stuff. We got helicopters from Shaw and we jumped. We did all kinds of things to just simulate the whole experience. That's a great idea. 
Yeah. So we ran, I ran press. That was, that was, uh, I did two of them because I wanted to share. I wanted to give back. And I think that's kind of the start of my ability or wanting to educate others. Sure. Um, and use my experience. Yeah, it was, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. And we, you know, we went out on the range and, and, you know, uh, all the guys at Bragg loved it because all these guys came in and we built some camaraderie. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, the schoolhouse and the competition. I don't know okay. if anybody's really talked about that. Um, uh, I touched on a little bit, but uh, yeah, please. I'd love to hear your take I, I on love, it. I love, well, I think one of the best things we ever did was having the competition. So the kudos to all of those guys at, at the schoolhouse who started the competition. Um, you know, I, I took away a lot of awards, Fort Bragg, but all kinds of guys. You know, that's where I met Marty mm. and Kibby, you know, a bunch of guys, you know, um, um, Mike Britton, uh, Bummy, you know, all these guys coming from overseas and other places to come down to, to, to Hurlburt. But what I think for me, it really made me more technical in my job. For sure. Um, you know, at Fort Bragg, we were all about physical and jumping. And, you know, I had 50 jumps my first year there um, and land navin and doing all kinds of stuff. But, you know, the technical part, the the radios, the communication, just those things. And I think the schoolhouse helped hone those those skills for us and made us better JTACs, made oh, us yeah. better, you know, uh, operators. And so it was great. And then I ran the 96 competition. Okay. Uh, and I'll tell you what, there was a lot, a lot of go on to go on there. You know, you had to find things that were challenging and that were competitive, uh, that were worthy of the, of the competitor's time that really test them. You had to troubleshoot it to make sure it was airproof and it, you didn't screw up. Uh, and it took a lot. It, it was it it was the number one thing leading up to the competition. But I think it was uh, the camaraderie, the skill base, the improvements that we brought in our career field. Uh, and I think it was it was an awesome thing. And I oh, just yeah. want For anybody sure. in the future to know the competition that was run at the schoolhouse was uh, an enhancer and something that I think really brought us to another level. Oh, I agree. I agree I totally. To yeah, it, it was great. It was it was great. And uh, so I just wanted to put that shout out to the boys. And then another little story. There's the statue that you get, you know, yeah. that from the schoolhouse. Well, inside the mole, it says legs rule. So that's a story <laughs> that was passed on. So the not airborne guys put in their legs rule or something of that name in the cast. So. <laughs> <laughs> that that's how they got back. They they told me that story after I became an instructor. Oh, Some yeah. of the came up and said, "I just got to tell you, we got you." And I'm like, "What do you mean? We got you, airborne guys." I'm like, "You know that statue? You know the Romad statue, the bust? I got one." And uh, and they're like, "Yeah, well, inside of it says legs rule, you know, in the bowls." I said, "Well, that's cool. That's good." You, know? you got yeah, you got them. <laughs> yeah, got it. well they yeah and and but kudos to them. They deserved it. They oh they, for sure. Were the, were the think tank and the organizers of the first competitions and something that went on for a long time. I just watched the 2022 Ranger competition on Fox. It was on. Yeah. Um, so it was, it's good stuff. It really helped uh, people grow individually as well as collectively. And I, I just wanted to put that shout out. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was um, Airman Magazine came. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, to Fort Bragg. And we got to be on Airman Magazine. The one, Shout out I want to give is to Charlie Daniels. If the, if you ever see that picture of the Mark 107 or 108, whatever it was, I think it was 107 because we were airborne. Um, and there's a guy, a Roman in a beret, and he's talking to a A-10, and, and the sun is setting or however that picture is, and it's yeah. a silhouette. Well, that's Charlie Daniels. Okay. So they came down. They, they interviewed a couple ALOs, and then myself and Charlie got picked to go out and, you know, sit in the foxhole and let them take some pictures. Right. But it was nice because they said we deal the aces and it kind of brought some publicity um, to, to, uh, to our work. Well, there's it been, nice. it's funny you mentioned that because there's been a lot of guys that I've talked to that because of that article and others, but may, that one specifically, that's why they, that's why they want to be a tech P they joined yeah. the military because of that. They saw that airman magazine, they either cross trained or they came in for it. So yeah, that to your point, that's, 
to get that kind of publicity, to get that kind of recognition is, is key. I mean, it's not just a dog and pony show, you know, it's not just a, yeah. you know, no, a it was, fluff it was, piece or whatever. It's an important yeah, no, stuff. It was awesome. And I, and I, in there is when I, you know, they asked, I said, Hey, I, I got 50 jumps in my first year at Fort Bragg. <laughs> Cause that's all we, you know, we had access to air, all the airplanes. Right. And so with, through our talos, man, we were getting jumps all the time. That's awesome. So, but yeah, that was a great article. Many people have mentioned it. Uh, I was just honored and proud to be part of it. Yeah. And, uh, and I knew it was good publicity and, and a lot of people came along later for Airman Magazine uh, because of the story. Hmm. But um, so anyway, I made some notes Um and one of the things that I wanted to talk about was, um, oh, we ran a bunch of Jumpmaster courses, and I want to do a shout out to Jack Hogan um, because when he came down from, um, he was in Alaska, and then he was at um, at uh, in Washington State working for, with the second bat. We set up some really good Jumpmaster stuff, and we got a lot of guys Jumpmaster certified, nice. and so that really helped us with with, uh, and we. Um, we did a lot. We brought up the CH 53s. Um, and then the, the story, Jack and I almost died. We had to auto rotate on a 53 down. And, um, I don't think I told him I loved him, but I told him if we go, I, I, I don't mind going with him. <laughs> so I see, I've seen Jack a couple of times. We stay in touch, but, uh, that was a harrowing moment to, we, and we pushed everybody out. And then I was like, Jack, this is, we should have brought a parachute, you know, uh, but we were doing ups and downs, sure. you know, so yep. from that day on, I've never gone on an airplane without a parachute, Smart. That, you know, you know, but we didn't have one. Yeah. So we're looking at each other like, what the heck are we going to do? <laughs> How stupid of us. Our parachutes are like, and we're like, well, and the and then the guy, you know, we're on the headsets and they're like, we're going to auto rotate down. And I'm like, oh, shit. you know, so what was the deal? Made, what happened to the, what happened to the aircraft? Who knows? 53 oh. shit it out. Yeah. Who knows? Something happened. Um, you know, of course, the, that day's worth of jumps was over. We were just happy to be alive. Right. You know, the rest of the guys, you know. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was that was uh, an interesting oh, uh, man. set of that. But the thing that Jack brought, and we, we had some before that, but we really formalized um, the, um, you know, all the work we did uh, around Jumpmaster mm -hmm. and uh, made that formal. And it really helped me. Uh, um, because when I went to, well, then, then what I wanted to talk about was um, the, uh, oh, one of the things I wanted to mention about Grenada and, and what, why we went to Grenada. I wanted to tell that story. Oh, yeah. Um, one of the things that happened from Grenada was the uh, Joint Special Operations Command. What they found was, um, and I gave you an example how we couldn't talk to the Navy, right. but they had you know, the army couldn't talk to its own people. You know, the Rangers couldn't talk to us. You know, I had to go up on a hill with Jimmy Felton and Charlie Daniels. We had to set up a HF antenna so we could talk back to Fort Bragg because Joe walks and the whole crew back there were like, Hey, what's going on down there? We can't get any information. <laughs> and so, um, um, because, you know, we didn't have call signs that, that piece of paper that, that, um, uh, Mark was talking about, I guess it's at the schoolhouse or whatever with all the, the people who are there in the call signs. Cause we had no idea. Yeah. There was no op order. There was no, um, you know, there was nothing. There was right. no TAC, TACC stuff, all that stuff you train on. We had nothing. Oh. So we made our own. Um, but one of the things that came out is the army realized that they had all these special forces guys, you know, the Navy SEALs. We lost four of them there, plus the other, there were Delta there and everybody else. And so they, they formed the Joint Special Operations Command. And then from that is where the regiment came in in 3rd Battalion. Okay. And so that's kind of the catalyst. I'm sure there was other things in the working, but from what my understanding is, because right after that, that's when I got word that they were standing up 3rd Battalion. Okay. And that's how I got to that but i'll talk about that but i want to go back to if you ever look at a map and you look at grenada which is one of the uh west indies islands it's the last one of the last ones they start with um uh, antigua barbados etc they go all the way down but if you look at where that is then you take cuba and then you take honduras because of the, the nicaragua honduras issue oh yeah, yeah. You, you'll see a triangle oh and, and you'll, you know, it's not a perfect one. Nothing's ever perfect. Sure. But you'll see that it's it's perfect for a blockade. Mm -hmm. And it's perfect for setting up. 
And what they had done in Grenada was they took the the civilian airfield there and they made a ten thousand foot runway. Oh, okay. And they and they were building barriers at the end of the runway, so they could have landed any Soviet made um, airplane on that runway. Oh, okay. That's what how I I was read in on because right. Right after that, when I got to the Rangers, uh, the next thing we know, we were going to Honduras. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so I got in; I was able to get into the intel of you know why are we going to Honduras and Nicaragua, and oh, we had to be quiet about it and all this other stuff. Uh, well, if you looked at Grenada and Honduras and Cuba, and then the other thing that happened, Jimmy Carter gave away the Panama Canal. Yeah. Okay, so that whole reason was set up for blockade. Not to mention. The Soviets and the Cubans were expanding in in our own backyard. Right. And so that's it wasn't just nutmeg, you know, Ronald builds, you know, there's more than nutmeg at, at you know, to deal with it in Grenada. Well, that's, that's it was it was the strategic placement of, of the things they were doing there. And of course, all the equipment, there were warehouses of equipment, trucks, weapons and everything. All that stuff was was sent out for uh, for for all the op fours out that did the work in, in uh, Arkansas, in the desert, you know, when you saw those op four and all those nicely dressed Soviet uniforms and Cuban stuff, it all came from Grenada. Really? Yeah. I I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah. There was warehouses full of it. Oh, that's awesome. Cause I went on two missions where we didn't know if we were going to get any resistance. So they brought, brought me along. However, when we showed up, we opened up these big old warehouses and they were just, floor to ceiling as long as and wide as it could be with soviet gear really yeah oh and one other story one one that you know there were three three uh tac p's one alo no two alos and charlie daniels that got wounded in in grenada okay and, and what that was they they got wounded from friendly fire oh man so what happened was um there was some anti-aircraft gun i think it was an sa-60 i, I can't remember um, it was the four barrel one, but they had on this ridge line. They had a couple, and and Charlie's battalion from the 82nd, along with the Alos, they took that that ridge line, and some grunt pushed over one of the SA 60s, and when he did, it fired a round off, and the airplanes, the A 7s, were going in and bound, uh, hitting a compound that we were all moving into, mm-hmm. and I was on the radio. Um, controlling the airplane. We had, we had an air fac and a helicopter too. So there was many of us and I was part of the, part of that communication team. And all of a sudden the, the pilot said, we're getting ground fire. And we're like ground fire. And it was the SA 60 that, that, that the grunt pushed over. Oh man. And it fired off around. So when he turned back, he fired on that ridge line, and that was all where all the friendlies were. Jeez. Yeah, and so three of our guys got hit. And so I, I was, and then I got that call, you know, cease fire, cease fire, friendlies, friendlies hit, friendlies hit. And it was Charlie that was calling me saying, we just got hit. And I'm like, and what the hell, you know? And that's what it was. The guy. Jeez. So when they were talking in the target, he just thought the target was where that, that ground fire came from. Oh my gosh. So. Man, it could have been a lot fun. worse, but man, that sucks. But yeah, yeah. I'm glad oh, he was yeah. all right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was it, well. There was there was one army guy that got really really badly damaged. Oh, really? So I I, I don't I think he ended up dying. I, I can't remember, but it wasn't it wasn't a, a clean friendly fire. That was for sure. Mm. Uh, and it was all self inflicted because the pilot remembered that ground fire from that SA sixty. He got pushed over and boom, Dang. Um, and then they shot up the and then three of our guys got hit. Like very like a finger, um, a sh- piece of shrap metal in the leg or something. Oh, you know, okay. Wasn't, yeah, it wasn't. Um, you know, they didn't like lose a direct any hit time. or anything. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but there was an army guy that did get hit oh, pretty man. hard. So as I was saying, um, I got back um, from all of that, and then we found out they were standing up the battalion, and so Howard McNeil went there. Uh, he grabbed radios from Fort Bragg to go down to start standing up. And then I went TDY down there. Um, Kenny Watterson was part of it. Jay Regan. Um, I'm thinking a couple other guys, but anyway, um, we, we went down to help stand up third battalion and uh, finally it got approved and we got official slots 
and official tack p um wild bill emsley was our halo he was the coolest halo uh he was great howard we stood up third battalion and then they immediately after that or kind of simultaneously were standing up the the regiment but the air force was slow in getting those manpower slots so as soon as the next wave which was avance jazz valella trying to think of who else came but but that was the main group they when they came down they went into the battalion and then i pushed up to the regiment and then we stood up the regiment completely and fully and then colonel k came in colonel kessler he was awesome too he went to ranger school he went to sniper school nice. um, he, he was a great guy and um and then we stood up the regiment and well third battalion then the regiment um and i think that's when i want to take a break and talk about alos um you know mark talked about it that was the the number one problem that i had in our career field and um they you know you most of them that came were trying to salvage their career the other ones were trying to get a better airplane you'd find guys like bill emsley colonel k you heard him talk about terry bittner uh captain troy um uh, Captain Story, um, I think it was Colonel Troy. He wasn't bad, but Captain Story. You know, there's there's a bunch of other ones. The names elude me. Um, they were great alos because they saw the importance of the job. But we never had leadership to move us on. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Mitch Monroe with Chief Fiscus and Joe Walks. They got us the crest, the flashing crest, and that was kudos on them. But I remember so many times getting in trouble on on Pope. And Air Force bases, because I, you know, I, no one was taking off my Ranger tab, mm -hmm. and I was, I wore my Recondo, and by that time I had, um, you know, I had 82nd Combat Patch, and these guys were like, you can't wear that, you know, and, I, and they were senior people, and I'm like, you know, take it off me, yeah, and right. they were like, who's your boss, you know, and of course my, you know, Colonel K and all those guys had me. I even went in front of the Chief Master Sergeant in the Air Force and said, you got to stop. I mean, this is my credibility, right? You know, right. I, and I always say, and I still to this day, going to Ranger School was worth a million dollars to me, but you'd have to pay me two two million to go back, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, right. because but it was instant credibility. Yeah, when I would walk in, and of course, I went on to go to Pathfinder and 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 Air Assault and Jungle Expert, you know. So, and I, and I went for for the knowledge. But more importantly, when I walked into my army counterparts, they would look and say, hey, this guy's got some credibility. Right. He's done the things that we want to do or we know we need to do. And but the Air Force would never let me wear them. And so there were many times I got into issues with it. Um, just getting the flash and crest took forever. Yeah. And it's because we didn't have ALOs. We didn't have anybody to fight for us. And when I was when I went to Hurlbert after Benning, um, I worked a lot with Agos and one, one, uh, class I got to take the, I was drive, you know, driving the Alos and the Talos and all those Agos people out to the field. And I got to go with a, a Colonel and I forget his name, but he was, he was an Alo when he was a captain. And so we, you know, we spent the next two days or how many days you spend in the field with them at Agos, not many. However, we, you know, we were talking and he said to me and I'll never forget it. He said, Ranger Dan, I don't understand. The same issues you're talking about were the same issues when I was a captain as an ALO. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, sir, with all due respect, when you left to go to your wherever you went, did you carry forth the TACP issues? Right. And he's like, no. And I said, that's the issue. Nobody's fighting the issues. I mean, they die on the vine when you guys disappear. Yeah. And so there's nobody, nobody to to fight for us. And um and and that was the thing that bothered me the most because every time you had an ALO come in, they played, well, I'm a captain, you're just a sergeant, so shut up and do what I want. And I'm like, sir, you don't understand what Pandora's box, you're going to regret this next exercise <laughs> right. if you do what they're telling you to do. Yeah. And then of course they were doing it because they didn't want any problems. They wanted, you know, they wanted a good review. And I'm like, sir, that's you're gonna have a miserable time. Mm -hmm. You're making us do something we don't need to be doing. Right. You know, are we, you know, this is how we operate or we got to do this. You got to understand we don't pull guard duty. All right. Our duty is to monitor the air system and to be ready for cl close air support. I can't pull an eight out of guard shift and then still do my job. 
Right. I mean, that's that's an army guy's job. That's a prime, you know, prime example. They always wanted to like, no, dude, I'm attached to you. I'm not your Joe Snuffy private. Right. But, you know, they'd go to the captain and camp. Hey, you got to go out and pull guard duty. I'm like, no, sir, I'm not going to pull guard duty. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. You know, unless you want to sit here. Well, I got to be in the talk. Well, then who's monitoring the radios and who's making sure that we're passing up requests and who's ready to go to to go do this close air support mission. And oh, by the way, I don't need to be up all night, you know, pulling guard duty. But those right. were other examples. You know, when we were back in garrison, um, you know, trying to have that work bot work life balance. Mm-hmm. Um, we just did but but to the issues of, you know, having us, you know, pulling, you know, JTAC was a long process. Mm-hmm. You know, we barely got when I was an airman, we could control, then we got to be E tax and then finally JTAX. And of course, you know, the the reputation we have and the significance of our work has validity now because of the war on terror. Right. You know, um, but we still we're still second class to CCT. Um, you know, but that's because they've had a long history of officers right, who right. were CCT. And, and so their issues, you know, um, I, you know, I was, I was just reading, um, in one of the school systems I work with, there's an, a special ops, uh, recruiter station there. And I found out from them that there's no more weather guys in, in, in everything. So they, right. they got, thrown, and now there's a thing called recon. Yeah, so I guess I they switched how, the weather guys to a special recon. Yeah, well, I wonder how long that'll last. I know. You know, um, we we need. I you know I think that the JTEC has proven it. I think that you know um, CCT loves to take love to take our jobs <laughs> from us, and there were many times, especially with the Rangers, that they would show up. And I would, they didn't know me. I was blended in. I looked just like the Rangers. I had right. a high and tight. They'd come up and they'd say, oh, you know, Air Force, what are you? Here? Well, I'm here to control the close air support, the AC one. And I, and then, you know, and, and then I'd say, no, 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 you're not. <laughs> Your job is to bring in the the airplanes right. for the parachute drop. And when we get to the land, when we get to do the airfield takedown, you make sure you clear the runway. But I got the AC 130. I got the fast movers. <laughs> You talk to me later, all right? <laughs> you know? And I would have to put them in their place. Yeah, and of yeah. course, all the army guys would stand up and say, "Yep, yeah, Ranger Dan, he's got that," <laughs> you know, because these guys would show up, you know, and never they never. I I lived every day, sure, in Third Battalion or the regiment every day. I went to work at Fort Benning. Right. They would show up for the exercises. So. Yeah, and they don't have any and not. It's kind of no hit on those guys. I mean, they they're probably yeah. just as good as you are, but. Like to your point, they have no credibility because the Rangers don't know who they are. And for a Ranger to not know somebody, you got to work hard to get that to get their trust. Whereas you live there every day, so you're automatically yeah they're not, they're just going to default to you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the other thing I would do, I would go to the air briefing. So on all, I don't know how they do others, but in the special ops world, there was an air briefing. Yeah. So all the air assets, whatever they were. There was a briefing about call signs, frequencies, airspace management, you know, corridors, the whole nine yards. I'd go to every one of those. Yeah. And so I had every call sign, every frequency. I knew where every every aircraft that was flying, whether the Medevac Corps, it, it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. I, I knew where it all was. And the reason being was in, in, in several cases, we could never get a hold of the CCD guy. <laughs> He's driving on his little bike, making sure the, the runway's clear and he can't hear the, you know, and here's a medevac coming in, and and here I was right next to the battalion commander or the regimental commander, and I'd say, "Hey, sir, we got to bring in that medevac. There's no CCT guy. What do you want to do?" <laughs> right, right. You know? And so then I'd have the internal CCT guys, and I'd be calling them, "Dude, come on, what are you doing? I'm clearing the runway. Yeah, but we got an aircraft coming in, and you need to clear it. You know, yeah. or either that, or I'm clearing it. Right, and, exactly. And, right, and I did do that." Um, when third battalion stood up, I actually got an army accommodation medal for me nice. because they couldn't find the guys to clear the runway. And of course, uh, you know, I was like the commander, he said, air force, clear the runway. And I'm like, dude, I'm not clearing that runway. I'm not going to have a C-130 run into something on the airplane. So, but then what I did, I was, I used all the FSOs oh, okay. and they said, oh yeah, the runway's clear. And then I went back to the FSO and I looked at him and say, Hey, they're all saying the runway's clear. What do you want to do? And then I turned to the commander who's in charge. I said, sir, we're getting reports from your forces that they're clear, but I can't get a whole CCT. But they had to bring that aircraft in to get the precious cargo. It was all part of their stand-up. Sure. So the commander, Colonel Smith, 
He said, Ranger Dan, I want that airplane on this ground now. I said, airplane, you're clear per the commander. The <laughs> battalion commander says land. And we landed, nothing happened, and that, they gave me accommodation medals. So. Nice. Right on. But the system, the system was against us. Mm-hmm. And and that bothered me the most because every time I turned around, I was reinvented with the ALOs. We never had that 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 prestige or the, we had to earn it. And I, I, I think that's probably the best way, but it would be nice for people just to realize. And I and, and, and during my 20 years, we hit we just, you know, everybody didn't look to JTAX. They didn't unless you had worked with us, you didn't know. Mm-hmm. You know, and right. there were guys in the Ranger Battalion. I remember going down to first bat, you know, there were guys having tattoos of tack P on, you know, and and those guys were gods because of the work they did uh, coming out of Grenada and other places. Sure. And, and, and we earned that as well, but it just took a long time. Yeah. So I was glad to see when they, we came under special force, under special ops and, and, and everybody's at Lackland and that whole stand up is there. And, and I just see it getting better and, yeah. and hopefully it stays intact because the specialty that we provide on the battlefield, I'm sorry, the army can't do it. Uh, not that they don't, they're not capable, but they have many other things to do. That's our right. specialty. Sure. And that's, you know, and there's, and Mark was talking about, um, having flight incentives. Yeah. There's nothing like flying an airplane to see what a pilot sees sure. and an army guy will never have that opportunity. Right. You know? And so we get that opportunity. We see that opportunity. We work with airplanes all the time. And so hopefully bigger and better things are coming, but I'm really proud of, of our, um, you know, our, our TAC P brothers or our one Charlie four, whatever we call it, JTAX now. Um, a lot of them went through the schoolhouse in the nineties when I was there and they fought the war on terror. But I remember seeing in 2010 a uh, thing that came out and said that JTAX were like sixth on the list of the most important battlefield enhancer. And that's because of all the good work of the, of the guys who came after us. Definitely. Um, definitely. So, it was hard in the beginning, and the ALOs were not easy to deal with. But we had some good ones. We had yeah. some good ones, and I was I was proud of that. Um, so anyway, went to the battalion. We did all you know. We went to Honduras, as I mentioned. Then we went on to Panama. Um, Mark was right. It was so funny because uh, I went into the international airport, which actually happened to be the place that Noriega was at. Okay. He was at the he um, supposedly. Three people from the American Congress had called him and said something was up. So he ditched, we had, he had a tail on him. He ditched it and ended up at the Air Force portion of the International Airport. Oh, okay. And he was there that night. And when we came in at 106 or 102, whatever the time was, uh, he heard the bombs and heard the stuff. And he's like, oh, shit, they are coming from me. <laughs> and he took off on the north end of the military base and, and I heard a report of a convoy, but it never came to fruition. And long later on, we found out that that was Noriega's little entourage of two or three Mercedes, whatever he had. Yeah. They were leaving the scene. Um, but that was at night. So the next morning, as Mark was saying, we're, all night long, they just kept coming. And then the day came, and they just kept coming. And we're like, where are they? Where are they? You know, and of course, it became a little bit of a, an issue because we, we had secured everything. Yeah. And now you had all these 82nd guys coming in. We're like, okay, tell these guys don't shoot. You know, <laughs> there's nobody to shoot at. We got it all under control. All Just right. land, gather your parachute, go to your assembly area and get the hell out of the way. You know? Oh, but when you they, say people kept coming, you mean like U.S. Yeah. forces kept coming. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, That's yeah, what okay. Mark was talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With the – because – as soon as he said it, I had like this PTSD because I was just, I was just saying to myself, Oh my God, we're going to kill some of these guys because the airplanes just kept coming. Yeah. They kept coming. And we'd say, okay, is that the last round? And we'd get word. No, there's another set of airplanes coming. And then it must've sent the whole 82nd airborne. Um, <laughs> and so they just kept coming. The, the, yeah. The 82nd airborne, the troops, I, I don't know who else jumped, but it just, you know, all, they were coming. There was a lull for a while. And then, once we got assembled, everything was secure. All of a sudden, we hear the 82nds coming. We're like, well, we don't need them, but that's okay. Just like Grenada, they were probably all suited up, ready to go. Yeah. And so 
we didn't get to jump. We had to throw our parachutes down, grab our rucks and run off. Right. So there, I, we, I was saying, well, they're just going to let those guys. In. But nope. Then another wave came. Then another <laughs> wave came. And then the sun came up and here they were keep coming, you know. So <laughs> it was. But that's that's because they had to say we had, a, you know, this is why we have airborne. Sure, sure. Um, but um, how was your you know, jump? Did you have any? Uh, oh, like, well, that, that, well yeah. I uh, I was on the fifth airplane. Um the fifth guy in the door, I was, I was right next to the door. I was number five on my chalk. And, um, first of all, when we we're flying in, we were flying parallel to Panama city. And I was like, Oh my God, we're really doing this. <laughs> and, uh, I had been to Panama city many times because uh-huh. we trained all the time in Panama. Yeah. We were always down there. And so, um, I'm like, man, there's Panama city. Are we really doing this? <laughs> and sure enough, we, we did. And when I came out, um, I was right on top of somebody else's parachute. And um, I, you know, the first thing they teach you is run off. I, I didn't even barely get off the parachute and I was on the ground, oh, you know, man. and I smacked like a sack of, you know what? And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I actually tore my leg. And so the next day when the sun came up, it was, you know, I, I felt like, and I was like, ah, and I had, I had work to do. Mm-hmm. And so I'm calling, doing my thing. And then the next day, you know, I'm, I'm like, man, my, my side hurts a little bit. And I reached down and I got blood and I'm like, what the hell happened? So I called over the medic and I said, can you see what the hell's wrong with my leg? And I had a little gash up there. So he sent me to the aid station. Well, they were giving anybody who got hurt on the jump, a purple heart. Uh-huh. And they tried to give me a purple heart. And I was yeah. like, no, I don't. I just got scratched, you know, (laughs) but then what happened was they also then came down and said they were going to give, they wanted, they, for the, from whoever the, that afternoon of the first day, they wanted uh, a Navy guy, an Air Force guy, Army guy, Marine, whatever, every service they wanted to give a medal to on the spot. And so because I got hurt on the jump, they wanted to give me a medal. (laughs) So not only did they want to give me a medal, and they wanted to give me a purple heart. So <laughs> I was like, dude, I, I'm like, okay. I mean, but I, I, I just did my job. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> so uh, we had a guard check between the, the, um, the on route one on highway one between the military base and the civilian base, the military base was North and the civilian was South. There was a guard check there and it got taken out. Um, by the guys I was with, but it was really the army guys that called it in, but I was there too. Uh-huh. And I was on the, I was on my radio verifying for the gunship. Okay. And so they took it out. So they wanted to give me a bronze star for the taking out the guard shack. And they wanted to give me a purple heart for getting hit on the jump. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> so, so I had to, I went and saw Colonel K and I was like, Colonel K, I didn't, I, I just, I, the army guys called in, the 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 strike i just verified it yeah, yeah. okay and i said i was still picking up my ass from smacking the ground <laughs> i said and the only reason why i went to the thing was because i had a scratch and in panama man if you get a scratch oh, it, yeah. it next thing you know you're losing your leg right so right. i've been there many times to so know you didn't mess around i just wanted some ointment and and patch i wasn't looking for a purple heart sure you know but they get we were giving away purple hearts when you walk through the medic tank. <laughs> like no 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 no. <laughs> so so anyway, when I when I left Benny and I got the, I well right after that at one of the parties I got the Snoopy Award. I, I wish I had it. I'd read it to you. But Mark and them, um, Kibby and Jazz, all those guys made me a little Snoopy Award, and they had a little Snoopy Band Aid, you know. <laughs> and it tells <laughs> it tells that story. And I laugh. I to this day I. I I just, I don't have it hung up now because it's still in one of those boxes. But as soon as I find it, it'll be one of the things I hang up for my yeah. kids. I tell them, they, they, I tell them this story and they laugh. And they're like, really? I said, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I came out. I was right on top of a parachute. We all had rounds. We were at 400 feet, yeah. you know? And I was like, oh, I got to get off top of this thing. And, and I, that's all I was worried about was my canopy inflating. And the next thing I know, I'm like, boom, right on the ground. Oh, man. So, but that's, that was that. So uh, it was an event, but no problem, you know, came out. Uh, there was a fence but on on both sides of, of uh, the uh, Highway 1, and it was filled with grass or it was overflowed. So they couldn't see me, but I could hear the bullets hitting the fence. Oh, wow. And, and of course, I was, you know, 
um, the FSOs were right with me. That's why we were all up front mm-hmm. on the on the on that stick. And and of course, you know, there was five sticks. I we probably had seven. I forget how many airplanes we had, but you know, we were all spread out so that we were all there because we knew that was a target, and we knew any reinforcements that would come would come there. And then on the um, there was a, a, a Panamanian brigade or something of airborne on there. So we were up front to make sure that any reinforcements or anybody came. So, but like I said, when, once I got it together, which, you know, it's just hurt. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. My rucksack was bent a little bit. Uh, I, I think it was my weapon that dug into my leg and, you know, I got everything. I carried my, um, I think we had, I think we had nine mils by then, but I always jump with my nine mil on top of my reserve. Yeah strapped on top of my reserve so you know i had that out i could hear the bullets but i could see the fso guys and i forget who it was but you know we were just talking to each other and and they were like we're gonna knock this thing out and and of course you know i had my radio up and that's first i didn't i didn't care about the weapon it was my radio and so i was on i was on the air force channel verifying the target because i was right there Mm -hmm. and and you know i could hear the rounds i couldn't see the target because i had my ass buried in the ground (laughs) but um but, you know, I knew it was there from the pre-targeting and I could hear the bullets from them shooting at us. Yeah. So um, anyway, that, that was uh, <laughs> that was the that was the. Uh, it, but then after that, we just hung out, did a few things and moved on. Yeah. So the um, I just then real quick, I, I left uh, the Rangers seven years. I was there and um, and. We would go down. Oh, I wanted to talk one more thing about Benny. We would go down all the time to Hurlbert to jump with those guys Mm -hmm. and bring airplanes down there for them. And then, of course, it was only four hours away. So we'd spent a lot. We did a lot of R&R with our families down there. Nina and and Mark and all the guys brought their families. And we would get over there in Destin. Um, They had a, 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 a camp for military people and right, we would right. stay a lot. Yeah. So we, we did a lot of that, but we would hang out with the schoolhouse. And then one day, you know, after a while, they're like, you should come down here and be an instructor. And so I did. Nice. And uh, I loved it. Did the challenge uh, being there, but the one thing, so at Fort Benning, you know, we all, we all were halo. So we all became halo. Um, I was one of the first guys to go to halo school. However, it took me three times. So, um, what happened? So um, I got the bins. The oh, okay. First time. I got the bins. Uh, I didn't feel good after going through the chamber and everything. And so I just, you don't mess around with that. And I knew that no, from yeah. scuba diving and everything. And I don't know if it was a, a nitrogen from scuba diving because we had done a lot of scuba diving when I was at Bragg. And, um, but anyway, I went to it and they said, you got the bins. So I immediately, I couldn't go jump. Sure. So they said, well, you just go to the next class. So I said, okay. So I went back to Fort Bragg and I hung out and, uh, and I waited for the next class. And then I walked in when the class started and they said, Oh no, 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 you can't take this slot. I said, but they told me to wait. Oh no, you, you, you gotta, you gotta reapply. Mm, So boom, instantly I had the next class. So I, I actually showed up on the first day and I got I was sent home on the on the second attempt because I didn't really have a slot. Oh, okay. And then I went the third time and of course I got in because they got me a proper slot <laughs> yeah. and I didn't take a um you know, that was one of the things that I found out when I was at, at Fort Benning over in building four. Every course, and you'll see a bunch of them on my military thing, mm-hmm. if it's a Dodd's course, they have to offer it to every service. Uh-huh. And and I found this out at Building 4, and I met the guy who represented the Air Force, and that's how I got the Pathfinder, the, the, the um, air, you know, the air assault and all that. And, and I got a bunch of guys through because I would go over there to Building 4, and I said, I want the Air Force's allotment. Oh, okay. And the same thing with Ranger School. And what was what was happening prior to that was that the army guys and anybody else out there would know that air force guys wouldn't show up. Oh, okay. So that's why you'd see a lot of standby guys in those schools because they know the three slots for the air force guy, there would be nobody there. Oh, so they, because the slots were allotted. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so when I broke that code, 
I went over to building four and said, you got it. And then I gave him all the command, you know, debt one. I gave him, the, you know, every huh. military, every tac P unit out there yeah, to yeah. even he includes overseas and said, because I had run press and prepared guys, I said, now you got to get us the slots, dude. And we get the slots because Dodds gets approval and the Air Force gets its allocation of all these courses to include airborne and everything else. That's so interesting because like we ever since I was at Benning, they they had a guy at Building 4 who did that job. You know, there's like a slot there now. And I, I just took it for granted that we always had one. But I, that's interesting that you were the, the guy that made that happen. It used to be yeah. like a cop. For a co- it was usually a cop, but then I think Sean O'Neill might have had that job for a while. But yeah, that's yeah. that's interesting that you that you stood that up. Right. Well, how I met him was all of a sudden we we get phone calls from Building Four because they would be taking out some officer's course or something, and they're going out to do uh, close air support training. They okay. were just going out for a familiarization, right? Yeah. Well, he wasn't an ALO. He wasn't a JTAC. He wasn't he wasn't authorized to clo- control airplanes. Oh, okay. okay? So normally they, there was a small detachment there at Fort Benning. Yeah. Okay. But we had a dozen something guys. And man, anytime you wanted to control airplanes, we were the first, we didn't hesitate one thing. We dropped everything and we were there. Sure. And not to mention, I think we were pretty good at our job. Right. Okay? right. And so he started calling us. And then, so next thing I know, I'm like, what, dude, what do you do here? You know? <laughs> And he's like, "Oh, I'm I'm the Air Force rep for Fort Benning, you know. I'm I'm I liaison with all of that." And and I said, "What about schools?" And that's how I I just asked him. That's what about so schools? cool. That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, because I I just thought, and I still believe that, as I said, going to Ranger School is worth a million bucks. You'd have to pay me two million, but the instant credibility. Oh yeah. And and from but but it wasn't just. You know, I had some guys say, well, you're just a you're just a patch, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. you just want patches. I said, no, I learned something in every school. I learned stuff in Pathfinder, Air Assault, you know, all these places, Recondos, you know, everything I went to increased my repertoire. Sure. My ability to be a better controller, not to mention I knew how to integrate things and how to, how it worked. And the Pathfinder skills helped me with drop zone work and bringing in medevacs. It, so it was all part of my repertoire. I went for the knowledge, but I also went to show the Army guys, I can do everything you do, dude. All right. I don't know if you know JT, but he brought up a good point. <laughs> and everybody knows this, but he, he mentioned it on the podcast. But if you if you walk in as a senior airman or a staff sergeant, you know, you're just an E4 or E5, and amongst yeah. these, you know, officers, if you don't have that credibility displayed, then you don't get the you don't get the respect that you deserve. I mean, you 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 bring such a uh, yeah. like an immense amount of firepower to the battlefield, but they're like, yeah. what's what's E4 senior airman Schmidlap over here doing? We don't need to talk yeah. to you. You know what I mean? So it's, that's a it's a great no, point. It's an, it's no, important. And, yeah. and you couldn't have you you know there were many times. I mean, I got a little pack that said, excuse me, general, you know, because I, I had to interrupt because he was, he was saying stuff that was, but I was the only air force guy there to defend ourselves. And I was just, you know, I was just a staff sergeant, but I I was like, dude, you're going to get people killed. (laughs) Exactly. To your your point, you know, that people said, Oh, this guy's been around. And then of course, you know, they, they just see staff sergeant and they don't see, the 15 years of 12 years of experience that's second to none. Right. And um, um, especially when you're in larger units where you don't live with the guys all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, in the battalions and the regiment, everybody knew me. I mean, that's how I got, how I became Ranger Dan because right. uh, Jack Stream at uh, Colonel uh, Stringen, he, he would call everybody Ranger. Well, everybody, you know, it, it was, it was Jazz, it was Mark, it was Dan, it was Eric. You know, that was our, we didn't call each other Kibby, Valella, you know. Right, right. So we called us by, and he didn't know what to call me, <laughs> you know. And, he, and, and But you can read Ranger Hannigan, but he would never see it. He just knew everybody called me Dan. So finally oh, one yeah. day he said, Ranger Dan, get your butt over here. <laughs> so everybody started calling me Ranger Dan. <laughs> and of course it came out about the same time Lieutenant Dan and Forrest Gump came out. Oh, yeah. So, you know. People were, you know, making fun of, you know, Lieutenant Dan and and so forth. But no, he he used to call everybody Ranger, and he wanted me for something. And he knew my name was Dan because everybody called me Dan. Right, right. Colonel K called me Dan. Mensley called me Dan. He know he'd even talk to me as Dan. But out in the field, you know, it's Ranger this, Ranger that. Sure, sure. And 
And sometimes he'd say, Air Force, get over here. But this time he said, Ranger Dan. And everybody's like, wow, he called him by his first name. <laughs> <laughs> and then it stuck after that. Yeah. But it was the credibility thing. And um, and I just wanted all the guys to have as much opportunities to go to these schools because sure. it did improve our credibility, but it it proved our repertoire. And when For I sure. found out the Building 4 guy held, held the key to it, and I said, dude, we're not controlling any more airplanes until I get some Pathfinder slots. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. That so, is awesome. <laughs> so but then the other thing that happened at Fort Benning was <clears throat> I thought when I went there, we would like be able to jump our butts off because every day there's three airplanes dropping, you know, static liners, airborne school. But it was hard to get on those airplanes. Yeah. One, because they were tired at the end of the day. You know, they have lift after lift after lift. Most of the time we could get a flyaway maybe. OK, but that meant they had to land and drop off the static guys and pick us up. But they would do a flyaway. But they but most we couldn't get any jumps. So one day we were at Maxwell. Maxwell Air Force Base was our Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. So we'd have to drive a couple hours, whatever, to get to Alabama, to Montgomery. And we're driving along. We went to the golf course because we wanted to eat and play golf. And I'm like, what are all these 130s doing out here? You know, and they're like, oh, there's an Air National Guard unit. So next thing I know, I'm knocking on the ops door <laughs> saying, you guys got 130s? Yeah, we're Air National Guard. I said, you like to drop people? You want to do some work? And and to fly from Maxwell to Fort Benning, it's a hop skip, you know? Sure, sure. And um, next thing you know, we had two or three airplanes a week. That's awesome. And 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 then, of course, I, I started saying, hey, we'd like to go to C Canadian Airborne School. We want to go to we want to go out and visit second battalion. We want to go control airplanes out in Utah. And they're like, we'll take you. <laughs> and so Anakin airlines was born and, uh, and we were flying all over the place because, um, I had a whole air national guard unit sitting there in Maxwell. That's awesome. And, and then what I would do is, you know, I'd bring the army guys, but I, they'd say, well, you know, Dan, we got to drop a, we got to drop a boat. We got to drop a heavy drop. No problem. We got a whole drop zone here at Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do when you want right. to do it? And then I'd go down to the riggers and everybody else. And I'd say, dude, do me a favor. Let's rig up a pilot and let's drop. I'm going to have an airplane land. You guys load it up and let's go. And then I said, you do that. We're going to Florida next week. I'll bring, I'll, I'll request five riggers so you guys can pack and go with us That's and we'll awesome. pay for it. And they were like, sure. How many, you, how many, how many heavy drops you want? Right. <laughs> like, well, just one. They just want to drop one, you know, <laughs> then, then they, you know, we did a 25,000 footer there at Benning because they, they had fizz techs over at Maxwell. We didn't know that. Next thing you know, the, the, the ops guy saying, Hey Dan, you know, we got fizz techs here. I'm like, really? And they got, they got a, a, a portable system and twin 22s and the whole console. Oh yeah. We got everything. I said, Give me the number. Better yet, you come up. When you coming up next, I'll introduce you to them. Uh, that's and awesome. The next thing you know, we got the fizz techs and everybody from Maxwell driving over to Fort Benning, <laughs> and we're sitting on the ground pre-breathing and going up to 25,000 feet. Oh, that's great. And it was just a day, and you know, and then of course now the the Rangers were like, you know, what do we need to do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you guys are doing 25,000 feet. You know, and, and then two. I I wouldn't say. I bet you we averaged one a week, if not more, for sure. But, you know, we would go up and do a 12, you know, because you could go up 30 minutes over 10. So they the crew would be on oxygen, but we'd go up, jump, yeah. land. It was, you know, we'd drive back from the drop zone and, and another airplane would come in and we'd get on that and we'd jump with them. That's and so awesome. we had tons of jumps um, and all the Army guys, whatever we needed. And, and of course we were heroes and so they always <laughs> took care of us, but that, that helped with the cred, you know, sure. they were always to take care of our air force guy. Cause when we get home next week, they're going to be doing an 18,000 foot jump or, you know, we would go out to, to the Dugway proving grounds, or we would go here because we would go out training and we had, we had our own airplanes. Yeah. It's all about those personal relationships too. You know, you can't be afraid to, I mean, this is kind of off subject, but it's, it kind of gives people some insight on how you can get things that you want. If you just like, just lean forward a little bit, you know, knock on a door. I mean, the worst thing you say is no, you know, but if you don't ask, I mean, you're not going to get it at all. You know? Well, I mean, to the fizz point, they had squares to fill. They had annual training to do. 
and they never get like to mutual do it. support. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a win-win is how it, how it worked out. Sure. Sure. I mean, did we do some extra things? Yeah. I mean, yeah. one time, you know, one time we flew all the way up, we went to Colorado, picked up a bunch of guys, uh, dropped off some things, went all the way up to Canada, brought them back, you know, <laughs> took them all the way to Florida. You know, did we do an extra few things that weren't necessary, but it's because we had squares to fill and opportunities to do it. But with the Fizz Tax band, they loved, they were calling me all the time. You guys go, you guys going to go do another altitude jump? And we'd say, you going to bring the stuff? Sure. <laughs> come on down. You That's know? awesome. Yeah. It was, you know, trying to find the time to do that, but we got to, we got to, you know, it was really the the first time we did a 25,000 footer to have that ramp come down. I was the jump master. We all were jump masters by that time, I think. Um, but to see that ramp come down and then stand there and see the curve of the earth, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, oh, my God, we're in heaven. <laughs> yeah, so it was good stuff. It was it was yeah. good stuff. And then, you know, after Benny and I went to Florida, like I said, it was great being at Hurlburt. Um, you know, we did we we did a lot of good training uh help train i i changed a little bit of the field stuff um when i first got there we were just throwing guys out in the field here goes my educational background and we had a lot of guys failing out because they just couldn't do it and so i changed it um we had um avance was there by then we had ramos was there so a bunch of the guys i said listen we need to take these students out for the first 24 hours they don't need to be students they need to they we need to be their mentors what you need to do is you need to show them everything you know to sit in the classroom and talk about packing and and carrying and navigating and doing all this stuff you got to show them right now a guy like me who came from the Ozark Mountains in St. Louis, in Missouri, where my grandfather lived when he retired, um, I knew how to hunt and fish when I was 12, you know? Yeah. But for a lot of these kids, you know, they had no clue what it was like. So that I was said, me. Gotta... That was me for yeah. sure. I was one of well, those kids. <laughs> well, and what I did was I said, we have a lot of washouts and we ha- we're losing some good people. These ki- these people were smart enough in some phases. They could physically, but I said, they're just not, if they fail navigation, you, you can't pass them, right. you, you know? And so we're having washouts and we're losing some good kids. I said, the other thing is when we do wash out a kid, I feel bad. Cause mm-hmm. I, for me, the military saved my life, you know, um, and, and, and helped me do so many wonderful things. I said, I just hate to see some kid life change because we didn't do everything we could to educate them. Right. So, and, and what I do is I would take the four worst students and I would take them in the field and then I divvy up the rest with the other guys. And, and we always had a little lottery, you know, where we, I, I made sure you had one good guy, you didn't, you know, but I said, I'll take the four worst. Yeah. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out there and I'm going to lay all my shit out and I'm going to show them how to pack the rock, you know, and I'm going to show them how to tie on their weapon. I'm going to show them how to tie on their, their thing. I'm going to make sure they have water in their canteens. I'm going to do all this crap that they don't know or they think they know, but they really don't because they haven't done it. Right. And I'm going to do it. And then, and then I'm going to navigate for them and I'm going to stop all the frigging time. And I'm going to tell them how am I getting through to the next point and what am I doing? How I oriented my map, all the stuff that they needed to do. I'm going to show them and I'm going to do it for them. And then I'm going to take and say, okay, who's next. And I'm going to say to the kid. And I said to the kid, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about screwing up because we're here to learn. Mm-hmm. And then I'd say to the other yahoos, you better watch this guy cuz you're next. And then I'd let them go and the whole time I'd be saying, what are you thinking? What are you looking at? How many spaces, you know, and I'd just be quizzing them on all the crap that they were doing to s- make sure they were processing it and understanding why they were doing what they did, you know? Because w- one of the things that amazed me, we lose so many weapons. We had dummy rubber weapons, right? right, right. But we, and I'm like you can't lose a weapon. Right. You can't, you know, and, and I understand they're rubber weapons, but you th- that's that's the number one thing, you know, yeah. they can't lose their weapon. It, that's just what's going to keep them alive. Right. So, but I changed it and I said, we got, when we go to the field, we got to personalize it to the point that everything we know, we got to share with them. Sure. And then if the idiot can't figure it out, then I don't have a problem getting rid of them. Yeah. He just you know? did, wasn't supposed to be there. At that point. Right. Yeah. 
Right. But you have to do everything you can to help them be there. Sure. Because they're there. And so we changed it. But actually, I think the guys really enjoyed it because they they you could tell war stories. You could give a little <laughs> insight, um, you know, and, and, and we we changed up how we did the field. And I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. And then, of course, what I would do is I'd have the uh, a bunch of times I take the four guys that were with me and I said, you guys set up your base camp. We're going to infiltrate your base camp hmm. before you know it. We'll be on the inside. You know, and so they, they loved it. We played little war games between my team and the others, you know, and so I just made the field fun and, and educational for the kids. And I really enjoyed that. I think it helped. Uh, we improved. We improved the uh, washout rate. It went nice. down like 10, 15 percent um, because of personalized it. That's awesome. And so and we didn't lose it. I mean, every now and then we lost a weapon, but we didn't lose a weapon. Uh, <laughs> I had a I had a, another war story. Um, I had a kid from the debt. Because we always needed people at the Rangers for just because they always wanted more. And so we had a bunch of guys that would come and work with us or wanted to work with us. So I, I this one guy kept bugging me all the time. I said, listen, I'm going to go on a regimental night op. I said, you can come with me. All right. We're going to jump into into uh, the D's, the drop zone there. And um, I said, um, and you're just going to follow me. And, and I'm just going to see how you operate and what you do. So we got blown off the, the drop zone. A bunch of people landed in the trees. He was one of them. Um, I'm at the assembly area. We move. We're waiting. And he's not there. And I'm like, where the hell is he? And Colonel K, I said, Colonel K, I don't know where this kid is. I said, it, but I bet you his stick got blown into the trees. That's the only thing I can think of. But I'm really worried. About that time, he comes running into the into the thing with a couple guys. And I said, oh, good. You okay? Oh, yeah, I landed in the trees. I said, okay, that's fine. You're here. Let's get to work. And a um, couple minutes later, whatever, he taps me on the shoulder. Can I have a drink of water? And I'm like, what the fuck do you want to drink of my water? No, drink your own damn water, you know? <laughs> and he says, I said, and then I'm thinking, why does he want my water? I said, where's your water? Oh, it's in the tree. I, I had to climb down. I left my <laughs> my harness, my vest in the harness, and I climbed down the tree. And I'm thinking, what a dumb. But I said, okay, here, drink some water. And then I started thinking, shit, we always jump with our weapons. Yeah. I said, where's your 45, asshole? Where's your <laughs> M16? And I said, he said, I don't have them. They're in the tree. And I was like, oh, my God. Because I've seen, I saw Reforger stop. When I did yeah. Reforger, I saw the whole exercise stop because somebody lost a weapon. Yeah. Right? I said, all I can think of is is once they find out he they they either found his weapon or he tell we tell somebody they're gonna shut down the whole damn thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and here I am with this kid, you know, that I invited to come along, and it, I, I'm gonna be no, no, no. So I I said, Colonel K, we got an issue. He's like, what? I said, I'm not gonna tell you. I said, but <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna leave for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> So, so I grabbed him by the back of his shirt and I said, come on, you asshole. You better tell me, you better find out where your shit is. Yeah. Okay. And of course, you know, he's like, oh, I don't know where it is. It's off in the trees. I said, when you got out of the tree, how did you get to the drop zone and find the assembly area to which they told you where we were? Oh, well, I know where that is. Well, get my ass back to the assembly <laughs> area on the drop zone, on the edge, wherever the hell it was that you showed up at. Okay. So we went back to the assembly area and I said, now, where did you come from when you came out to the drops? Oh, I was down that way. I said, okay. So we walked down. And then of course, by that time, the, the, the riggers were out there and everybody's getting down the parachutes because there was, you know, a whole stick was in the trees. Yeah. So I said, now you better find that thing. Perfect. So we go over there and I knew all the riggers. I knew everybody because of all the jumps we did and all the work we did together. And they're like, Ranger Dan, what are you doing over here? I said, he left his radio in his, I didn't tell him the weapon. I said, he left his radio in his, in his gear hung up in the tree. I said, <clears throat> they said, Oh, we'll get it for you. I said, no, just give me the tools. I said, I'll get it. You guys do your other stuff. We'll get it. Cause I, last thing I wanted them to was pull down his shit and see that he had his weapons hanging. Right. Yeah. Cause trust me, they would tell the story. Oh yeah. Off they went. Especially because it's I, an air force guy. Yeah. Yeah. Especially. Yeah. So I got the tree climbing stuff and I said, you're getting that get out of there I'm, I, I'm sitting here okay and you better not ask for my help because if you do i'm gonna stick this pole right up your what you get, you get your shit down okay and we're gonna go back to the thing and you better not say a friggin' word 
or I'll never talk to you again. And I'll tell everybody when we get back what you did. Yeah. So, so we got back, we, you know, Colonel, we show up, is everything okay? I said, everything's fine, sir. We took care of it. And of course, <laughs> later when we got back to the squadron, you know, it's like, what happened? What happened? I said, I, I, you can't repeat this, but that dipshit got out of his gear and left his weapons hanging in the tree and then came all the way over here instead of stopping and saying, listen, I had to get out of the tree, but my weapons are, you know, I, I said, never just stay there. Right. It would have been okay. But the fact that you left it and then went to two assembly points, I said, <laughs> you're, you freaking, we used to say you never went on another mission with us again. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but, uh, but those are the things that guys didn't know. And I was always wishing that we had trained them in certain things and help them become better because you can't that one food ball, you know, let's see those 99 attaboys and one old shit and you're yeah. done, you know? So, um, <clears throat> that was, I'll never forget that. But there's a lot of guys to your point. Like there's a lot of people out there that are trained and, and I don't know what, what happened. I was kind of the same way, but that the weapon doesn't have as the importance as it should, you know, like that. If you don't have that, you have no way to defend yourself. Yeah. That's, it's a super important. Well, <clears throat> when I would go to the field, I got those old bandoliers that that they would bring with with the um, five five six in the cases. Oh right, right. And, I, and then I went to the supply and I got a, a bunch of 10, 10 round mags. Okay. And then I went down to the riggers and I had them reinforce that. And so I would carry like two of those bandoliers already magged up. Okay. And people would laugh at me, and I'd say, when we get in a firefight. Those six mags you have in your pouches, it's going to be gone in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. What the hell are you going to use next? I said, uh, 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 uh. I'm not, <laughs> you know, and now look at them. They carry vests. They got mags everywhere <laughs> right, because right. They, you, you go through them in a heartbeat. Said, the last thing I'm going to do is run out of ammunition. And of course, if I have to fire, we're in big shit. Sure, sure. I, you know, I'm <laughs> exactly. behind. I'm, but then when I went to the forward line, there were many times, you know, I'd be at the battalion headquarters and I'd have to get out to one of the platoons and, the, and you know, the FSOs would, and the, and the you know, the fire support guys would, would be part of that team. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I went by myself. Yeah. I was like, shit, I'm, I'm not going to get in a fire. I don't know what's out there, but I'm, you know, this is, this is what's going to keep me alive. Right. This radio, you know, I mean. I always said, you know, I can kill more people with the handset, but when you're out there by yourself, yeah. that handset's not going to do much. It's your weapon that's going to keep you alive. <laughs> right. So exactly. I made sure I carried a, two bandoliers already banded up and, and had them on the outside of my rock. Um, <clears throat> because if I needed them in a firefight, what am I going to do once you run out of six? Because, you, you know, you, your ammo pouches only carried three apiece. Right. So, I mean, that's not a lot around when you're in a firefight. And then, of course, you know, you watch all these movies. These guys are shooting for 10 minutes and they never reload. I'm like, gee, that's a great weapon to have. I know. Exactly. In a firefight, you go through them like, a, you know, they're hotcakes. So, yeah. anyway, but I wanted to make sure the guys were trained on all the things and having all that experience. Um, you know, you didn't, I didn't want the army to lose that credibility. That, and that goes back to the ALO thing. So many times they ruin our credibility because they they were fighter pilots. They mm. weren't ground guys. They had no clue. And and Agos, which I told you know I worked with a lot. They didn't do shit for those guys. Man, it was no. a camping trip. You know. So yeah. it was. But anyway, to um, kind of finish up because we're we're getting along here. Um, <clears throat> the schoolhouse. That's how I got to um, the UK and Third Air Force. I loved it. I loved third air force was my last assignment. I was there for almost six years. Um, you know, um, the thing I loved the most was working with the USAFE guys. Um, never had the chance other than the competition and a few times through the schoolhouse, you know, cause I was always in the airborne special ops ranger thing. So getting to USAFE was really cool. I really loved, um, working with all those guys, so many professionals and, yeah. uh, you know, Mike Britton, was the best. Uh, and one of the things that we did, um, was, uh, West Bryant. We, we did a thing called partnership for peace. Have you ever heard of that? I don't think so. So after the Soviet union broke up, they, um, <clears throat> they just, they decided whomever they would be <laughs> that they would do these things for partnership for peace. And the partnership for peace was they invited all the former former Soviet bloc countries. Okay. 
to come. And what basically what it was, it would be attached to NATO or something to do with NATO. And these people from Slovakia, Georgia, um, even your Ukraine. And of course, it led to, and if you know your, a little bit of the history, when the stuff happened with Ukraine, since the Soviet Union broke up, 33 countries joined NATO. Okay. Well, one of the steps to join NATO, you had to be part of Partnership for Peace. Oh, okay. So what what they did, they came down and Mike called me and said, do you think we could do this? And 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 they want to they want to run a three week course about tech peace and what we do. So I said, well, we got to have a place to do it. So that's where Agos, Yusefi Agos and West Bryant came in. Oh, okay. They had the Agos school there. It was perfect because they were doing JTAC training and they were doing us, you know, standardization stuff. But they really didn't have a lot of Agos classes anymore because of the drawdown. Sure. And this gave them lots of business and put them back into business. But we had a beautiful facility. And then at Sembach, they had moved so you know, the A-10s were gone. Everything was gone out of Sembach. So we had all that space. Oh, yeah. And so we did <clears throat> Partnership for Peace. Nice. <clears throat> and we invited all these countries to come in, and we ran a three-week course. And unfortunately, we could never get into – we did use some airplanes from from NATO stuff, but we, we just couldn't tie into it to get what we needed to really show them how to control an airplane, how to do the whole process. So we ended up just getting our own airplanes. So we, we went to the Brits, to the Italians. We went to, uh, we found out when they had different air exercises and we tied into that. And then we, we, uh, we went to, we flew them down to Vicenza where they could do live drops, but we just did all over the countryside in Europe. We drove them out to certain places and set up a, an IP and an OP and, and had airplanes fly in for all day from that all these things. Awesome. And then had all these, I, I got a picture. I did find one picture looking through my stuff of us out in front of you, safety, I guess, but we had, usually they had about 15 people. Um, some of them were, but it was more um, uh, air traffic controllers. A few countries had some similar uh, jobs that we had, you know, as a forward air controller, but it was mainly a, their air traffic control system. A few colonels, a couple times there was a general or two high, you know, some, they would come and see how we ran the, the command and control okay. and how we executed that whole thing to include how we dropped bombs nice, and how we ran airplanes. And so there was five in total. The Brits ran two, we ran two, um, I never, I don't know who did the fifth one, okay. but, um, and it was partnership for peace. And, uh, awesome. it, was, it was three weeks long. We had, we had, we had unlimited budget. <laughs> oh my God. So you're going all over Europe, unlimited budget, yeah. just controlling well, cast and partying. Exactly. Well, <laughs> I, I, so I would sit at third air force and because it was third air force, I could make the phone calls and mm-hmm. I could line up the airplanes. I could get, you know, get the idea when they would surge in, when they were available and just find out the best times where, where we could get 15s and 16s and the A-10s, you know, a, a nice overlap. Uh, but it wasn't just that. It was the tornadoes that, you know, the, the Harriers, everything we could get, you know, mainly British, but I was right there in England. So sure. it wasn't hard to go to the, the British liaison and say, I get this and get that. And so we would line it all up. <clears throat> and then um, I would set everything up and I would fly over, I'd get a rental car and I'd fly, drive around and then get everybody to Yusefi Agos. And then we'd start the course. And then of course I paid, we, I didn't personally, but the funds paid for all the Yusefi guys to come to Sembach and they got full per diem and full travel and everything else <laughs> to, to, and we ran mini Agos three weeks of JTAC. Um, for all these foreign people. And like I said, it was the catalyst you had. Well, I don't know if it's still true, but at the time, if you did partnership for peace and then your country said, we're interested in joining NATO, that was one of the entrance exams to being considered to join NATO. And so a bunch of those people from those countries, an interesting thing, 
We had some Ukrainian, but then all of a sudden they never came anymore. I don't know what happened to that. Huh. But uh, we had Georgianians and Slovakians and, um, you know, Poles, the, the whole nine yards. Yeah. It, it came. We, even had, we had Swedish, Swedish and Finn people, especially when we did the Partnership for Peace in England. We had a lot of guys, um, a lot of troops from Finland and Scotland. I mean, uh, um, Sweden and Finland. Um come for that but nice. we had all these all these countries it was really cool because yeah. you know um we took them all over germany all over england because we we had you know sometimes you got rained out sometimes you didn't have an airplane uh certainly the weekends you didn't do anything sure. and so you know, we had funds to buy them food and we had rental vans we loaded up we drove <laughs> all these places showed them it was it was a partnership for peace and it was really a good time we i made a, i still have friends i still have their address and I still contact them every now and then. Nice. Send them a Christmas card or whatever. All right. Kind of got DX with COVID, but um, yeah. I, I found that list and I said, you know what? I should make sure they're still alive. They didn't get hit by COVID. All right. Tell right. Them up. But but it was a great thing, and that was the that was the thing I loved the most about Third Air Force um, was doing partnership for peace. <laughs> That's a cool gig. That's really yeah, neat. It was, it was it was really good. And then um, I. One day I went in, you know, because I had, I was at 19 plus years and I had to go to those mandatory retirement briefings. And uh, I went in and these two dudes were there and said, we're here to talk about troops to teachers. And as I said to you, I was I was tutoring kids at the elementary school at Lake and Heath. And I just went home and I couldn't get it out of my head. I said, this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. So. I said, I'm, I'm going to go do troops to teachers. That's awesome. And so I left there. John Ulanek came over. Big John took over. Yeah, yeah. Made the ship run. And of course, as soon as I get back to the States, it took me a few months because I stayed in Europe and went around seeing everybody and spending time. My family came over. But um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm back for a few days, maybe a week, and then 9-11 happened. And I was like, you know, I'm done. I'm not going back. And, yeah. Because I actually wanted to go back as a Department of Defense school teacher. Oh, okay. But they don't do certifications. They they'll take a state cert, but they don't certify their own teachers. Oh, okay. So they said, "Hey, we'd hire you in a heartbeat, but you don't have a certification." I said, oh. "Well, I got an Air Force thing," and they said, "No, you need a state certification oh, okay. uh, to be valid for Dodds." So, and they don't, they didn't run one because I guess it wouldn't have credibility. So I said, well, you know, I'm going to go back to the States and I'll get a credibility, I'll get a license and I'll just come back. And they said, well, you come back, you got a job. Nice. Well, 9 11 happened and uh, it's just, I never, yes, yeah, I cut away from that. And that was, that was the circle of life and, uh, and how I got to, the, to where I am today. Well, that's amazing. That's really cool. Yeah. I, it's, it's really interesting because, like I said, I, when I was looking at your bio, um, there's just so the, – the, the amount of degrees you have is just amazing. You know, you before you got out, you had, what, like probably five or six degrees or something like yep. that? Then you got your doctorate. I mean, that's just that's just amazing. And, um, and the, the work you're doing – and I like the fact that you're like – it's not like you're um, trying to be some prestigious uh, professor. You're actually trying to make a difference. You're actually trying to yeah. help kids – because that's that's really where the where the help is needed. You know, anybody can just you know get tenure somewhere and you just kind of skate. But there's yeah. people out there, there's kids out there that really need to, your guys like you to mentor them, and they need assistance to get out of that situation they're in. So that's commendable. Yeah. Well, that's that's really awesome. Yeah. You're doing that. Well, what's really cool is they all play Fortnite, and they all have you know um, all those games, Mortal right, right. Combat, all that stuff. You know, my son's upstairs right now playing it, <laughs> right. and. Um, and so, you know, he's like, Dad, I, I'm doing an airstrike. How do I do an airstrike? You know, and I'm like, let me tell you. And, and then, of course, all the kids on his his podcast or his whatever they're doing, you know, they know what I do yeah, yeah. or what I did. So I'm telling them how to mark a target and, you know, <laughs> make sure you run your airplanes parallel to troops. Don't come over or at, you know, blah, right. blah, blah. And so they're like, why? Why? Well, I said, well, what happens if you drop the bomb short? What happens if you go long? You're dead. Go right. parallel, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, and then, of course, you know, they're all pretending to be free fall guys. Right, right. 
oh yeah, I got a thousand of those things, you know. <laughs> so, but that's how I make connections with my kids. I just say, listen, I, I've been on the front lines. I'm here because I want to help you because I grew up like you. Uh, and I don't want any of that other, that bureaucratic stuff. It's what I didn't like about third air force. I just got tired. Nobody cared about the troops. That was right. one of the things that bothered me about a lot of the things they did at third air force. They didn't care about the boys in the field. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't care about the guys at K town or any of those, those out, those debts that they had out there. Right. They were just, you know, I'm like, no dude, they're, they're my brothers. Yeah. You know, they mean something. They're not some pawn in your big chess game. Right. You know, and it's the same thing. I worked at three universities, as I put in my my bio or resume. Um, and I just I was like, get me out of here, man. I, you know, they, they didn't care about the students. Uh, well, they, they did. How many do we have and how much can they pay us? Exactly. You it's know? about the money. And I said, what about them learning how to be a teacher? Yeah. You know, so so I, I just I just worked at at the school level, like I said, 17 years as a principal. And I bring my teachers in. I, you know, I told the stories uh, about training the airmen and our and our brothers in the job. Well, the same thing I do for my teachers. I, I'm like, you know what? Forget all that they taught you. Let me tell you how to be a teacher in the, your classroom. And I'm going to go in and show you. And it's a, it's about, you know, kids don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Right. I sit there and say to them, listen, dude, you may be here and you may live in poverty. You're, t- you're maybe unsafe whatever but here we're going to help you be good readers and writers and mathematicians and i'm going to help build your character and we're going to have a safe and caring school you know and yeah. when we had those gangs and when i went to the to the it was lawrence massachusetts you might have heard um trump talk about how bad lawrence massachusetts is well it was bad yeah. i had kids come to school wearing colors and so forth and so on and um um they would care. I mean, I, within the first few months I was there, I found eight knives on kids, you know? And I'm like, why, why do you have this knife? At first I was worried they were coming to hurt us yeah. or my teachers or no, they carried the knives because as soon as they left school, they had to defend themselves all the way home. And so once they, I started catching them, well, we kept searching. We no knives. Well, what they were doing was they were finding hiding places on the way to school and yeah. they were stashing them so that they would leave the grounds. So next thing I knew, I get the gang unit and I say, dude, you need to start protecting my kids. Yeah. Well, what are, you know, I said, here's what they're doing. I said, my kids, it's a neighborhood school. I want to put a bubble. I want to put a perimeter around my neighborhood school so my kids can come from home to school without worrying about gangs. Right. So what do I need to do to make that happen? And so we put it in a plan. No more knives, no more gang. Kids weren't wearing colors, and the gang stayed away from my school. Yeah, that's and awesome. There were, there were 25 schools in the district. I would tell the gang. I, I stood right in front of gang members who were like, I'll beat your – and I was like, come on, man. I'm right here. And, of course, you know, I was a lot – even I'm, – I'm 63, but I was – Still, back then at that school, I was just out of the Air Force. Sure. I was like, come on, man. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to bother me, but here's the deal. Why are you messing with my 12-year-old kids? You know, I know you're recruiting them. Recruit them someplace else. Matter of fact, there are 25 other schools. Go over there and bother them, but mm-hmm. leave my school alone. Right. Because every day, you know, I had I had, I had 1,200 kids in that school. So <clears throat> I had 100 and something faculty members, and I had – five or six big dudes. And every day we would walk that perimeter. And of course I, I made friends with the chief of police, the judge. And I said, you better come over here. I said, because here's, what's going to happen. I'm going to get one of these gang bangers and the, I'm going to dump them in the river. And you're going to have a problem because they're not going to mess with my kids. Right. They're like, Oh, don't do that. Don't do, then get your ass over here and tell them to stay away from the school. Cause it's protected. Exactly. It's protected by you and protected by the people inside. Our scores went up, our kids' attendance went up, and no problems after that because they just said, you know, it's not it's not worth it. And I told them, go go hassle them when they go someplace else, but stay away from my neighborhood, stay away from my school, and we won't have a problem. I mean, just think of just think of every principal in those in those inner cities or those those underprivileged places were as adamant about it as you were. I mean, do you think I don't know, I think we you could get a lot more progression, a lot more, a lot better with these kids. I mean, it just seems like everybody, they kind of, 
accept their lot in life and they they they're like they complain about the school they're in instead of actually being proactive and doing something about it like you did you know well that's that because i grew up in one right you know i was in a gang at 13 well supposedly <laughs> yeah. i was just a, i was just a punk lookout that could run fast yeah. that they just used you know right and because i was white in mostly black neighborhood i, I didn't get to do a lot because i kind of stood out sure, you know? sure however i was still fast and still could do it and and so forth and there was enough mix of people that i didn't look too odd but yeah. i was gravitating toward that and i didn't even realize it yeah and so and the same thing i saw in my in my in my school, because when I got there, that's what people say. We're we're infested with kids that don't care about school. All they care about is what gang they're in, blah, 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 or who, you know, all this stuff that was extracurricular, but it wasn't focused on being good readers and writers and mathematician. And I said, you know, how do you think I got these five degrees? How do you think I did what I did? I said, because I got my act together. And they'd say, well, it's really easy for you to say, but I'm going to get beat up tomorrow because they want me to go over and be a lookout or they want me to join their gang. I said, okay, we'll take care of that. And we just let it, you know, and others just wouldn't, they would just be disappointed with the kids and the families because they didn't do anything about it, but it's your job to do something too. Exactly. Help them. And, exactly. Then, and of course I, I, I got on the police and the chief of police, you, where's your gang unit? Right. Why aren't you out there harassing these guys? Yeah. Make them go into the woods, make them disappear. They're walking the streets like they own the whole place. And unfortunately, in Lawrence, there's a lot of problems. That's why Trump talked about the drugs. And, and you know, we, we had a lot of competition. But our little part of the, of, the, of the landscape there, we put this bubble around it. And I protected it with everything. But I also took time to meet with those kids. You yeah. know, I would go down where the gangs hung up. And I would just go down and say, I, I don't want any problem. I just want you guys to leave my kids alone. Right. And I get it, man. I get it. I, I, I was flirting with a gang when I was a teenager. Okay. You, I hear you, but what kind of life are you going to have? You know, they probably oh, had a lot of respect for you to come, to come down and face them. And they probably, you know, they probably held you in pretty high regard for doing that. I mean, it's, they don't, they, it's much like, just like any criminal. They're not looking for the hard target. They're looking for the easy way out. So they're probably, you know what, let's just leave these guys alone. We'll shift over to this neighborhood, this other school district or school area. And yeah. Well, the other thing is that, um, my kids were cousins or brothers or, you know, or sisters with some of these kids. Yeah. And, and, and deep down they were happy. That I was, I was protecting their, their siblings, their cousins, their family. Right. Right. You know? Because that's what it was a neighborhood school. Oh yeah. So, I didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was all neighborhood. So, and I would say that to him, dude, I'm trying to protect your cousin. I'm trying to protect your little brother here. Cause if it's not your gang, it's going to be the rival gang over here. Right. OK, or because he's associated with you, you just put his life in jeopardy. Right. You know, you go out and find another rival gang and then they find out you got a brother in my middle school. You don't think they might come after him? I said, stay away. Don't put him in jeopardy. Yeah. And then, of course, the you know, I, I we opened up our school to all the families. We had all kinds of events. And I would say to the families, listen, if you're having problems, let me know. Cause I, you know, I took some kids, I, I got them jobs in my school so they nice. wouldn't be hanging out on the street. That's Cause I awesome. said, why don't you, you know, and I would go and I'd find some funds where they pick up trash after school until mm -hmm. mom and dad got home. They didn't ro roam the streets. I found grant money where I opened the school on Saturdays. You know, I extended the school day so they would have safety within our school so they didn't get exposed to that. But I would go to those gang members and say, it's your cousin, man. That's your yeah. brother. You know, that's his brother. That that's somebody you know. Do you want them to be your life? You know, right. some you get some smart ass that say, "Yeah, I want him to be just like." Well, that's fine. But while he's in my school, he's not going to be like you. Yeah, yeah. In the meantime, I'm taking care of him because he's my student. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, they it didn't take long for them to say, "Hey, this guy's done a few things in his life." You know, <laughs> I don't think you want to mess with them. Right. <laughs> And, and I, and I, I wouldn't shy away from it. And of course I use the police and the court system. I have, you know, I made really good friends with judge, judge Rodriguez there in the Lawrence district court. And he would come over all the time. He would run uh, workshops for parents. He would come over and talk to kids. He was a street kid uh -huh. and he became a, a district judge right nice. there in, in the town that I lived. And so he came over and talked about how he avoided the gangs and stayed out of trouble and took school serious, went on to get 
college law degree. And now he's, you know, a judge. Yeah. And so, you know, I started bringing in role models uh, just like my kids to say, dude, you know, I made it. He made it. Look at this person. You know, you, you, it's your choice. You don't have to be part of that. And of course, what we eliminated was the temptation, but also the problem. Right. Because if you're obviously tempted all the time, they'll recruit you. And part and one of the things that makes gangs is be, you feel a sense of belonging. Mm hmm. No? Which is what Somebody, they're looking for. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, we we took that void. Yeah. We made sure that they knew we cared. We had a sense of belonging to us. And it was to their education and their future. And so we 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 just pushed that aside and said, that's not where you want to go. Yeah. You know, this is where you want to go because here's what we're going to do for you. Right. And here's what you're going to do when you get. And so, you know, I went out to all the local businesses and brought them in. And so you can be a banker, you can be a doctor. Oh, you want to be a teacher, you know? And so, uh, you know, so we, we did a lot of things to show them that they had options and choices sure. and that the street and the environment didn't have to be that they could make the other things. And here's how we could do it for them. And, you know, we, like I said, attendance improved you know, significantly. We went from the high 80s to the mid to upper 90s in attendance. Uh, scores went up 18, 20 percent uh, because they learned how to read and write because they could concentrate in class and yeah. in school. They didn't have to worry about what was going to happen after school. God, I can't. I mean, people, uh, you can say whatever you want, but a lot of the people in this country don't understand that. Like they don't understand that. Number one, they think, well, why don't those kids just get, you know, do something else? Like, well, number one, they don't have the exposure to these other opportunities. Like it's not even an option in them. No kid, they can't even understand. They don't even know it's out there, first of all. And then second of all, they, they don't know how to get it. You know, they don't, they don't, they're just stuck. They feel like, and third, they're sitting in class. They're like, man, I couldn't care less about this history lesson. I got to, am I going to get shanked on the way home? Am I going to get beat up? And, you know, it's like, or it's going to make me I sell go, drugs, you know? Yeah. Well, Lawrence was a, um, was a town that used to be high in manufacturing. So it has tri-level homes everywhere. Uh -huh. So a lot of it was dysfunctional. So what am I going to go home to? You know, is the guy selling drugs on the third floor? Is there domestic violence? Is there a gang issue? So there was a lot of issues they had to deal with. And so we helped them by staying away from that or helping their parents find different housing and different options. But we showed them, you don't yeah. have to go this path. So to your point, um, but it was it was the fact that we showed that we cared and then they they were interested in what we did and how we did it. And that's what I've done in in three, four urban school systems. I just go in and say, listen, uh, I, I know how it is. Oh, how do you know? And then, you know, I'd go through the whole thing and then we put in the stuff. And and that's why I, I, my stuff was recognized five times, um, because the improvement in a place that didn't have, an, it had terrible scores and terrible outcomes. And people would go, how did you do that? Well, here's a roadmap. I can tell you people say it, they're racist. No, they just don't understand sure. the teachers or the people. They're not racist. They just don't understand. I understood. Yeah. I also worked hard, you know, being an enlisted guy in a, in a field where you had to work hard to succeed and survive. Right. And so, and then of course I'd say education, Look at the education you can get. And I never push the military on people. I just push the discipline, the leadership, the, the, the dress right dress, the conviction, the goal setting, you know, use some of those principles to help the kids do themselves. Yeah. And say so you can control this man and then bring examples. Right. Because when I first started about 25% of the kids were doing okay. Within a short period of time, we were up to 33 and then eventually 40. And so the, as those classes moved on, I was able to bring those kids back. And they, these kids knew them and, and they would tell their story, how they listened to what we did and what they did to avoid the wrongs and the temptations and the bad things that were out there and yeah. how they focused on the good things. And then, oh, by the way, there's a good, there was a good now 40% of the population that was doing good things and you could survive in that. Yeah, you could stay away from the six, the bad stuff because you could assimilate with the good stuff and stay on that track and avoid all that other stuff. And so th that's how we showed them how you stayed away from it. And you how mean, like you like that how sense you of purpose it. and that that yeah. that drive. Yeah. yeah, that's good. 
on the sense of purpose was and belonging was those 20, 30, 40% people that could now be your friends. Sure. And the system that was set up where the teachers were there, the system was, for, was, was there for you. And then getting community involvement to come down. So the banks would come down and work with the kids and, and the local, uh, the Boys and Girls Club and all these different organizations became partners with us so that our kids had all these good things to do and, and, and advancement. We brought in junior achievement and other different programs yeah. to help the kids um, find avenues and use their, you know, beautiful things. And I always said growing up, my friends and I, we all had talents. We just put them in the wrong place. Right. <laughs> and so we, we were all capable, yeah. but we were just a bunch of poor black and white kids in an urban city in St. Louis and nobody gave a shit. Yeah. About us. And so I just provided those opportunities and told them that and showed them that and said, you got great skills. Now let me help, help you make them even better so that you can go on to do great things. Cause you can have options and, and stuff. I made partnerships with the, the uh, vocational schools and other training programs and showed them, you don't have to go on and, and, and go to this school. You can go and learn a trade. Sure. You can go on and do great things and you don't necessarily have to be, you know, have a doctorate, you know, maybe a bachelor's degree a little bit, but maybe not. Yeah. A little community college, a little vocational school, trade school. You know, if you like to do this, this and that, there's options out there. And, and of course, the other thing we showed them was, and th this was one of the fundamentals of Troops to Teachers, was there's a, there's a whole big world out there. Right. And so when you live in an inner city like I did, I, I never thought there was anything past, you know, I just knew you didn't leave Berkeley, Missouri, because if you went to Florissant, you get your butt kicked, you right. know? Well. So, I never left Florissant and all I thought was that Florissant was, was it. There yeah, was no, yeah. you know, and there's nothing the else out there. Yeah. Yeah. We showed them. No, there's big world outside of Lawrence. Folks. So many other things. Yeah. Yeah. So many other things. And that, those were the other things we showed them the possibilities, the opportunities and help them have hopes and dreams about the future. And just that along with all the things we did, you know, we made project, you know, what, one of the things having gone through the schoolhouse, everything was hands on, progress, you know, performance task. Mm -hmm. I made a lot of things performance task. Everything was, you know, project based. It was it was hand on kinesthetic things. It wasn't just somebody sitting there, blah, 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 you know, the, yeah, yeah. with kids, you know, they got up and they moved and they did things. And we had art and all this other integration stuff. Um, expeditionary learning. We went out and cleaned out the creeks and picked up the trash and worked in old folks homes and did all kinds of work outside the, the school and then talked about the education needed um, and the things and the skills that they could do to run that, that organization. Right. But we went out and, and did it so they could see what they were learning and how it applied to real world. And it was all performance based and they loved it. That's awesome. And then we celebrated and had fun. <laughs> right that on. was one thing to be sure, you know, that we celebrated their, their victories and let them know that they were special. Sure. And that they did it. And, and it was very rewarding and that's why I'm still doing what I'm doing. Um, and we'll see. But the well, that's next, awesome. But that's really I, cool. But when COVID hit, um, my son was in fourth grade and I was, everybody was worried to include myself. So I stayed home and homeschooled. Them. Okay. And then when that was over, my mother needed me in Tennessee. So I went to Tennessee um, and helped fix up her house, got her all situated. She's doing fine. So I just moved back to Massachusetts in, in December. Oh, that's right. You did mention that you you recently yeah. moved back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I was here, I left, um, 2022. So a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, I went down there and stayed with her cause I, I, I didn't have a job and we were still doing COVID and I wasn't sure if they were going back to school and class. Yeah. I wasn't going to have my son with a mask. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was so, a mess. That was a total mess. But he stayed home with me the whole time. Oh, man. I bet he thrived on that. I bet yeah. That was great. Oh, yeah. Mommy didn't have to quit work. He he stayed. We did all kinds of – I taught him how to fix a tire, start a car. Used to be able to – I could take off the carburetor, but I showed him all the things, check oil. But I showed him how a tractor run. He cut grass. You know, we did all this stuff. I taught him how to cook. Um, you know, we just did all this homeschooling and had tons of fun. And then, um, 
it just happened. I was home and my mom needed some help. And everybody's like, well, you're not doing anything. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> I'm doing a lot. But they yeah, said, yeah. You, can, you can go. You're retired. I said, yeah. But so I went down there and stayed with her. And and uh, I love Tennessee. It was a great constitutional state yeah. and uh, lot no taxes. Right, right. Yeah, so it was great. But she's fine. Everything's good. I was hoping she'd move back up here um because we used to live here that's why i came here a long time ago right right before i went into the air force they moved up here i went into the air force um and but she didn't want to come she said the winters are too cold yeah so so i said okay well that's fine so she's staying in tennessee her house is fine the water works it's not going to fall over that's good the squirrels are out of the attic (laughs) the deck is fixed you know so i just took that year and a half to get her squared away and now we're we're here nice so been a while two hours i think is enough material to no this has been perfect this has been great this is i, uh, yeah. I would love i'm gonna i'm gonna listen to everybody else because i think you got the best seat in the house jd oh i it i agree i love it i love every minute of it i think it's the so stories cool stories that those guys would tell you yeah you know like i said i i watch marks i started watching a few others um and I was just like, God, the memories. Holy cow. It was, yeah. a, it was a nice, it's, it's beautiful what you're doing, brother. Wow. So again, it's my pleasure. My- and I love the, I love the, like I said, I love the peers, my peers to kind yeah. of share stuff that we didn't share when we were in, but I, I really love when you guys like you come on and that came before us and kind of, like I said, that building four thing was mind blowing, you know, and just, yeah. you know, just laying that groundwork for all these guys. And, and then now these other guys can kind of see where we all came from and, you know, how far we've come kind of like you to your point like you were saying like now they're just they're all centrally located and we got you know we have tech p officers and it's they're, they're every mm-hmm. kid comes out of tech school like just a machine just a just a stud and it doesn't yeah. matter where they go like we kind of alluded to the leg thing versus the airborne thing you know there's yeah. none of that animosity really anymore it's all just like everybody's yeah. just a hard charging tech p and it's great yeah no, it's, i, I it's it's even it's it's the kind of thing that we dreamed of wasn't sure when it was going to happen. Right. Um, and it was a lot of, a lot of hard work, a lot of disappointments, a lot of anger. Um, you know, like I said, I, I'll never forget when I was at, at Lackland and everybody went off and there I stood and they all thought I was a dip because <laughs> I didn't know what Keesler meant or whatever. And I'm like, dude, I, and so we went from nobody knowing, you know, who we are to being rated in 2010 as one of the six most important uh, professions in in the D- Department of Defense. Right. So it's a it's a forty year journey, and I just I, I can't wait to see what the next twenty looks like. Same. Um, I think that you know, as you said, the caliber of the people coming, and and we had a bunch of good people. So oh wanna, yeah, don't get me wrong, for yeah, sure, just absolute but, animals. But the for central, sure. yeah, the centralization of it. Um, I think there's there's more people moving together than just a few of those those people that were in the right place at the right time. Right. Exactly. You know, um, you know Chief Fiscus, God rest his soul. He was a great guy. You know, he, like I said, he helped get the flash and crest, you know, guys like daddy walks, you know, they were great mentors, but there was only a few of them. Right. Now yeah. I can see everywhere you turn, you got tons of those kinds of guys. Yep. You know, Dennis Wise and Doug Tillman and oh, all yeah. these guys, uh, it's not just a few, it's, it's a bunch. Right. And not because the other ones couldn't do it. There wasn't the opportunity. Right. That that's the thing. I think the opportunities and that's, you know, if there's anything that came out of the war on uh, Terra is that the opportunities presented itself to show the value of who we were. For sure. And then the, the training and the systems came in behind it. And now we're ready for whatever the future may be. And I'm really worried about the future, but that's another story in itself. <laughs> right. But, uh, another two there. hours we can go into, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we're there and I'm really proud of my brothers. Me and, too. And um, hopefully when they see this, just let them know that Ranger Dan is proud of them and happy for them and, and continue the great work. And then we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> right on. Well, all right. Thanks again. I really appreciate you doing this. And I, I had, no, thank this you. is awesome. Tons yeah. of kudos to you, brother. Yeah. For making it happen. Yeah, it's again, I'm glad to do it. It's awesome. Well, anytime you need anything, let me know. Okay. We'll do. Appreciate it. All right. God bless and enjoy, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Again, God bless. You too.